Go live, go live, go live. Hello everyone, how are we all doing? Tonight is Patreon 64, Epic Blunders of Naval History. Always a fun one to deal with. And it is a fun one. It's a very fun one. This was presented, uh, proposed by Vincenzo Alba Abate. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. And it is Patreon 64. So, without much further ado. Hello everyone, how are you all doing? How goes the world? As you can see, I still have computer boxes to my right. Because the computer is all running and it's all fine. So I haven't packed the computer boxes away yet. Just because I'm waiting. Just being sure. Ah, it's a fun, fun time. And hopefully you can hear me clearly. I have had the fun playing around with the sound system. And I'm hoping it's all working correctly. Hello, Carl Van Gasberg. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Al Bozaski. Hello, Michael Cooch. Hello, Tanner Berger. Uh, hello, Night 6 everyone. Hello, Cody85. Ah. Nice to go for it. Not one, not designing the KAG-5 with 915-inch guns from the start. You see, the thing is, nice to go for one, I think you're missing the, the question to an extent. You are talking, there is a difference between what is a mistake and what is a blunder, and what is an epic mistake versus an, an, versus an epic blunder. And so that's what I'm sort of working through. Hello, Tana Velka. Hello, ooh, all the things. Hello, Senna Canera. Uh, Jack Ray, Jim B. Hello, Vision. Could you start with an intro in uh, with the intro theme from Conan? No, mainly because I can't remember the intro theme from Conan the Barbarian. But you never know. Maybe on the um, record on the recorded version of this. Second, only three things go on the big screen: movies, TV shows, and Doctor Alex Clark. That's slightly worrying for me, and now I'm starting to wonder if I should be on 60 frames per second for you, rather than 30. Hello, Amelia Burrow. Hello. Ooh. Hello, Jim B. Hello, Jack Ray. Hello, everyone. Hello, that was Aski. Tanner Burka, John Shea, Stafford. Hello, DG40. Hello, everyone. Right. Ooh. Thank you, Jack Ray. You gifted five Dr. Uh, Alex Clark memberships. Thank you, Seneca Nero was gifted it. Uh, Nautical Wolf, hello, John Svonk, Stafford Thompson, Ollie L, Anna Rapol, Colin Cameron, and Mike Strinkins. That's nice. I didn't realise you could do that. I, I, I think I've seen it before, but I didn't realise it. Hello, it was fun on everyone. You need to talk I may not be in the whole video chats as much in the next few months as I, co as I coach University of American Football this time of year. Good luck. Good luck. In my experience, that is... Um, how do I put this? When you're winning, you're very popular. When you're not winning, you are basically a town pariah. So, good luck. Um, have fun. And I hope there are videos of the game so I can watch them. Because I do like a bit of American football in, 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 at times. Hello, Lions. Hello, Good Lander. And John Sykes. Hello, everyone. Right. Um... You're... Stafford, get off the lot of video now. Go away. Go, go, go. I, I don't normally tell people to go, but it's, it's your mum's 59th birthday. Mum first. And trust me, from experience of cooking Beef Wellington, go watch the Beef Wellington. Beef Wellington is one of those dishes where you really do not want to burn the pastry. So, happy birthday to your mum. Go look after her. Oh, and I figured out why the, the why the camera sometimes shakes. There is a little wooden bar on this desk, and I just have to tap it ever so lightly, and the little shake I put down there turns into a big shake by the time it gets to the top of the screen where the camera is balanced on, which is what we've got for the moment. But there is plans for a better camera coming. 
and that camera will have its position moved because it'll be mounted on the IKEA wall bookshelf. But it can be because it's a different type of camera. Hello, Wayne. I was reading early. Uh, was reading earlier that the design of the Admiral class was done off the book for Admiral Fisher and was supposed to have 18-inch guns. Mm, that wouldn't surprise me. How's the PC running? It's running very nicely, thank you. Uh, you could probably get 18-inch guns to work on the um, on the hoods. The Admirals definitely could probably take a take an 18-inch guns. It would have been twin turrets, and it would probably have been six of them. But it would have worked. As in six guns over three tw uh, twins. Hi there, old router. Hello, Glenn. <laughs> Here listening, but still on my PC. <laughs> Why, Seneca, why do I have a different colour and a sign next to my name? Because I think you're one of the people who was gifted a membership by Jack Ray. Because he decided to gift five people with memberships. Just, it allows you to play around with emojis. Right. Epic blunders in naval history. Let's start off with some definitions. Because I wouldn't be much of an academic if I didn't start off with a definition at some point. Uh, Even if I am an academic leading a lecture. Well, uh, uh, what I'm seeing is a seminar wearing a Star Wars t-shirt. Because, well... Nothing says epic blunder quite like a TIE fighter. So... Blunders. Noun, a stupid or careless mistake. Verb, making a stupid or careless mistake, act or speak clumsily. Okay. So it's not just got to be a mistake, it's got to be a stupid or a careless mistake in order to be a blunder. This makes things e interesting. Epic. Well, it can be a long poem. In fact, some of the best epics are worthwhile reading. Adjective relating to or characteristic of an epic or epics. Heroic, grand in scale, or character. So, definition for an epic blunder is a grand, stupid, or careless mistake. So, if it is not a grand, a large one, it isn't an epic blunder. And if it's not a stupid or careless mistake, it's not a blunder. There are many mistakes we make in history. There are many mistakes made. But. Are they necessarily going to be an epic blunder? That is the question. Hello, Felix. Glad to hear you're enjoying a pizza. <laughs> Seneca Nero. <laughs> enjoying the emojis. There is a beef wellington there. <laughs> so the French dreadnought design. I was kind and I didn't put French dreadnought design in as an epic blunder or a grand stupid and careless mistake. Because let's be honest, it is a mistake, but it's a not a it's not stupid or careless. It's a logical mistake drawn from a logical fallacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I need to get my teeth straightened at some point. Ah, oh, well, too many rugby games. <laughs> H. I've heard arguments that the TIE fighters were essentially military police cruisers to buzz the colonies and fit well with that doctrine. The problem was the rebellion showing up. I digress, though. The TIE fighters are many, many things. That's her, uh, a free twin 18 inch hood. She's untouchable political, early, Dr. Clark. She would certainly have been interesting, and let's be honest, it would probably have caused a real rethinking of the Washington Naval Treaty. Junicole. The whole Junicole could be considered to be an epic blunder or grand mistake. Theoretically, we'll get into that.
So, let's start off with Ancient. Well, we have the Battle of Cape Economos and the Battle of Chios. Now, one of those you've heard about before because I've done a video on it. So I hope you've, wa you've watched that video. If you haven't, we will be going through that. But one of them, you haven't. And, well... The Battle of Chios is... An interesting one. It's a sea battle fought between Philip V of Macedonia and the combined fleet of Rhodes, Peregum, Byzantium, and Sisychus. Now, it's part of the Cretan War. Which started when the Macedonians and their Cretan ally, their pirates and Cretan allies, had decided to attack Rhodian ships. As at that point, Rhodes had the richest fleet in the Aegean. Rhodes allies joined the Rhodian fleet, and they decided they then went to attack the Macedonian fleet. Now here is the thing. Philip starts off with roughly 200 ships. The Allies with 100 ships. However, Philip loses 92 ships sunk, 7 captured, 9,000 dead, and 2,000 captured. Rhodes lose 3 ships sunk, 60 dead. Pergamon, 3 ships sunk, 2 captured, and 70 dead. So, why is this careless? Well, during the battle, Philip V and his flagship accidentally managed to ram one of their own ships when it strayed across her path. This was because the helmsman was inexperienced and hadn't been able to correct her course in time. This put the flagship out of action, uh, trapped by this, the flagship was then put out of action by two enemy ships, which rammed her below the wharf line on each side. The Macedonian navy was massively stronger than the others, but they'd only been raised a few years earlier, and they just didn't have that much experience. It shows you how long it does actually take to train a fleet, even considered a relatively simple galley fleet. It's not an easy process to get the oarsmen up to the standard. Atalus, who was in charge of the Rhodian... Well, he was the ruler of Pergon, and he was in charge of the fleet, broadly speaking. Then managed to try and be even more stupid. As he prevented one of, tried to prevent one of his ships being sunk, and was in in this process himself driven onto the shore. Philip, who had managed to survive the loss of his flagship and had got off it, managed to capture Atalus' ship and towed it back through the battle, trying to convince the rest of the Peregrine fleet that their king was dead. The Peregrine fleets withdraw, and the Macedonians took advantage of this. To escape. Now, I'm not sure you can call it an escape when you've lost a hunter when you've only leaving with 101 ships out of 200 you started with. But I suppose they had captured two, including a flagship of one of the enemies. This battle was careless. He had the strength. He shouldn't have fought it. He should have decided. He should have kept away from it. He didn't need to fight to win. He was winning without fighting the battle. When he fights the battle, the experience of his forces isn't enough, and they get taken out. And this pretty much destroys Macedonia as a naval power. So much so they pay very little part of the Second Macedonian War. At 
Catalus, well, he unfortunately left all his money behind him on his ship when he ran ashore to escape the Macedonian pursuers. Mainly, that helped him, though, because it made sure the Macedonians were so busy counting their riches they didn't bother following him. And the, vi well, Theopilissus, who was the in charge of another of the fleet, uh, he was in charge of the Rhodian fleet, died from his wounds uh, that he received during the battle. Wayne's World of Science and Technology. Do you include the Second Pacific Squadron not sinking Kamkatcha on the said day of sailing? No, because that doesn't qualify under the decisions, does it? Joss Funk, Langsdorff attack on the African East Coast? Um, that's certainly a blunder, but I'm not sure if I'd call it an epic blunder. Oh, the Royal Route is far worse going on by the US in World War II than that. Colin Cameron, so does the Kaiser's decision to challenge the Iron Supremacy when basically allied to the UK? That certainly is up there as a stupid in terms of an epic blunder. Because, let's be honest, you already have the world's most powerful navy on your side and you don't have to pay for it. Oh, why get into a building competition when you could be the army for them? How's the PC treating it? It's treating me well. It seems to be doing well. And how's it going for you at the other end? I'm, I don't know. I'm watching this a bit. I think it's working okay. It's telling me it's got an excellent connection, and I hope it is. Give me a second. <coughs> mm -hmm. Don't sweep up leaves. It whatever dust or whatever allergies you have will be affected and you will be sneezing afterwards. That's my advice for autumn. Don't sweep it asleep up leaves. It seems it looks nice. Doesn't seem stuttery, so it's all good. That's good. Well, the person who gave the Kaiser a copy of my hands influence on the sea, possibly, but I think he already had, you know, those sort of things. The Battle of Chios is a good example of the importance of time to create a force. It's also one of the reasons why I have it as a careless mistake. Is Philip V had also spent ages, years building up an army, and the thing about Philip V you have to remember of Macedon, is he's quite a successful king in many ways. <laughs> and he's a very successful king in the sense of he managed to build up a navy, he managed to build up an army, he does challenge the Roman Republic at a couple of times. Um, leading Macedon against Rome in the First and Second Macedonian Wars. <laughs> he allied with Rome in the Roman Seleucid War towards the end of his reign, and he was a powerful power. Now, saying all this, And understanding all this.
he wasn't necessarily the most sensible when it came to sea power. It could have been his strategic strength, but instead, even though he spent years building up the army, he froze away the navy. And the navy would have been really quite useful, especially in his wars versus the Roman Republic, because he could have probably held off quite a lot of their involvement in Macedonia if he'd ha had managed to maintain a stronger navy. You are looking particularly sharp tonight. Is it a new camera, Dr. Zeke? No, new camera hasn't arrived yet. New camera is... Well, currently I'm debating whether to order the new camera yet or wait till it goes down a bit in price because I have a feeling it's going to go down in price because of the various things going on with the camera market at the moment. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. It's sitting there waiting to get and be got. <laughs> not a wolf. Decisions leading up to have you free, but a US would be a good one intro. Mm, I'm not really sure if you can call that careless or stupid, really. It, they are misled by their opponents. So if you're saying that it's stupid when your opponent manages to succeed, you're kind of being, to an extent, very egotistical. You're presuming that your opponent is always so much weaker than you that even when every time they manage to get one over you, it's because of your stupidity, not their success. Ooh, the Battle of Sleaze and the Battle of Swally. Mm-hmm. Careless versus stupid. The Battle of Sleaze. I have got, I've done a video about this one. I do enjoy the Battle of Sleaze because it's a good example of... Yes, we are going to apply land warfare tactics to the sea. Mm-hmm. Really? You are? And how do you expect to survive in this scenario? What we're going to do is we're going to line our ships up and chain them all together... So our crews can't easily move, and it's going to enable the enemy to concentrate on one end of the fleet and work their way down the fleet. Oh. Well, it's not as if your enemy has any sort of advantage in ranged, per ranged weaponry and skirmish personnel, does it? Yes, it's an army which is almost a good 50% or more made up of people who are longbowmen. Well, longbowmen, what characteristic do you associate with them? They are going to be massively strong upper body strength. The sort of people you really don't want to grapple with in close quarters or have firing arrows at you. Oh, great. The Battle of Swally. Now... That is fun. Also known as the Battle of Savali. Um, it took place between the English East Indian Galleons fighting the Portuguese. Now, please note... The English had, well, the East India Company had four galleons. The Portuguese had four galleons and 26 barks, which didn't carry guns, but 
this was going to be a kind of interesting battle. On the 13th of September, 1612, a squadron of 16 Portuguese barks sailed into Surat. On the 22nd of September, 1612, Captain Best decided to send an emissary to the Emperor, asking permission to trade and settle a factory at Surat. If refused, he planned to quit the country. This may have been partly because James I had extended the company's charter in 1609 on the basis that it would be cancelled if no profitable ventures were concluded within three years. Uh, by the 30th of September, Bess got news that two of his men, his purser, Mr. Canning, and a William Chambers were arrested while ashore. Best, as a result, acted as all good merchant vessels do, detained the ship belonging to the governor of Gujarat and offered to release it if in exchange for his men. In October, Captain Best and his ships then sailed to Savali. Small town, 12 miles north of Surat. This was probably because the governor at the time, who might have been Sadar Khan, was battling a Rajut rebellion at the fort in the side of town, and thus would be happy to receive assistance. So, between the 17th and 21st November, they, he best managed to negotiate and obtain a treaty to the governor, allowing for trading privileges subject to ratification by the emperor, and in return for providing some support versus this annoying rebellion. On the 29th, the Portuguese turn up, and there's a skirmish between the two navies without much damage on either side. On the 30th, Captain Best in Red Dragon sailed through the, Portuguese, the four Portuguese galleons. And while he do, it, did this, three of those galleons ran aground. The Portuguese managed to get the three galleons refloated. At 9pm that night... In an attempt to set the English ships light, a bark was sent towards them as a fire ship, but the English watch was alert and the bark was sunk by cannon fire with the loss of eight lives. The standoff remained until the 5th of December when Captain Best sailed for the port of Dieu. The thing about this event is it very much impressed the governor of Gujarat, who then reported to the emperor, and this allowed the emperor to become more favourable towards the English than the Portuguese. Now, if you want video, I've done a video on the Battle of Quebec Onmas. It's one of my Roman series. Hmm. To an extent, Colin Cameron, I'm not sure I would call the treaties necessarily entirely one-way street as a masterstroke. We do know why the French decided to fight that way. The French thought it was the strongest way they could position themselves as a fight, 
and that therefore they'd be all lined up and it would be a nice sort of like a land battle. They imagined the British ships would come up to them and then it would be ship to ship individually all along the line. That's what they actually seem to be thinking. Spanish Armada being a blunder. Hmm. I'm not quite sure I'd call the Spanish Armada a blunder. It's certainly mismanaged. It's certainly ill-conceived. But the Spanish didn't lose anything other than a navy, really. And they rebuilt that soon enough. It's a costly lesson. But it's not a blunder. <clears throat> if they managed to land and have their ships taken off them by the English, that would have been a blunder. But no, that wasn't. But no, both, all these battles so far, it's a case of epic or stu uh, epic blunder. So it's got to be stupid or careless. And I've, designed, I've divided every single section up into stupid and careless. Because that seemed fair. Hi, Dark Squad. Everyone. In regards to the treaty, as it true the USA used Hood's huge size to shrink down the Iron Fleet? Nope. I read the US saw Hood as a political liability and used her size against the RN. No, not really. It's a case of there is a lot of strange stuff written about the, about the treaties. And most of it is post hoc ergo propter hoc. I, I, after, therefore it must be because of, and that doesn't necessarily follow. The British went into the treaties with their eyes wide open. Remember, they also thought they had the 10 year rule. So the thing is, the British, uh, well the British government at least, is trying to save money as much as they can, and are crossing fingers that they are not making a grand strategic error. And also trying to buy the goodwill of America to make sure that in the event of them ending up in that kind of war which they do end up in World War II, they end up with a benevolently neutral America. Which is what they do end up with. Why? Because of the fear of air power. How do I put this? Um, okay. A guy called Gilio Duhe comes up with this great idea that the strategic bomber will always get through and it will carry ever more exp ever more expanding loads of bombs and these bombs will be biological weapons this is one of the reasons why some people look at nuclear warfare and go well yes the americans used it on japan when the Japanese had no ability to respond. But both Britain and Germany had huge, colossal stocks of biological war weapons throughout World War II. Nerve gas, everything you can think of, they have huge stocks of. At no point does either side reach for them. They don't drop them to save the forces retreating to Dunkirk. They don't drop them to ease the advance of the troops arriving in Normandy. They don't drop them on German cities in response to the Blitz, and the Germans don't respond, drop them on the Br uh, Blitz on, during the Blitz to squash British morale. Both sides have huge stockpiles of these weapons. 
Neither side uses them. Why? Because then the other side will use them. And neither side wants them to use them. So, you have the idea that, oh yeah, you'll use nuclear weapons as long as the other opponent can't fight back. And therefore the assumption nowadays has to turn into mutual assured destruction, the idea that if you use a nuclear weapon, it, you're guaranteed to, in any sort of major war between powers, you're going to end up being fighting nuclear. As I think it was Einstein said, I know not what the weapons of World War Four will be, but uh, uh, well, of World War Three will be, but I do know the weapons of World War Four will be sticks and stones, which is a lovely idea, but there is a small problem. Basically, ever since all sides have got, when all sides have such weapons. As long as they have them, they tend not to use them because they know they'll be coming back. Unless you push them too far, and it's working out where the too far is. No, six, eight, nine, six, eight, three, one. Wish we had access to all the Washington Naval Treaty records. We'll never get access to them at all. I doubt most of them exist anymore. John Sykes. I was told that the term Black Irish came from the dark hair, dark skin influence of the shipwrecked Spanish sailors on the Irish population. Is that true? Um, not really, but it's certainly a large dent of the Spanish population does arrive. Colin Cameron, the UK still has Port of Anne. Yes, we do. Go Galanda. How true is it that the idea that Hitler didn't want to use the gas because he knew what gas was like? Unlikely. Let's be honest. Compared to some current world leaders who've been lauded as strategic geniuses, Hitler was a strategic omissar. Omnisar. So, uh, yeah. <sighs> now, Chesma is one of those battles you don't hear a lot about. You should probably hear more, but you don't. It took place between the 5th and 7th of July, 1770. It's during the Russo-Turkish War of 1768-1774. And in it, the Russian force of nine ships a line, three frigates, a bomb ship, and four fire ships and four supply ships take on 16 ships a line, six frigates, six Zebex, 13 galleys, 32 smaller craft, and about 1,300 guns. And whilst the Russians lose a ship at a line and some fire ships and roughly 700 killed and 40 wounded, the Ottomans lose 16 ships at a line, 6 frigates and escort vessels, 13 galleys, 32 small vessels and at least 11,000 men. That's chemical weapons, not biological. Mm, there was definitely a mixture of the two. Um, I know people tend to focus on the chemical weapons, but there were also other things there as well. And the Germans did not do research into them and had success. Did do research into them and had successes, but Japan was the senior partners area avenue, and Japan had a way to retaliate plague bombs. Honestly, Japan's plague bombs weren't really a way to retaliate, let's be honest. They had an idea about how to use them, but they couldn't really reach America with them. The plan was, at several points, to use balloons and various other things to try and get in America. It wasn't really going to work, because let's be honest, if those bombs land down in the middle of, I don't know, the vast, in the vast emptiness that is most of America in the 1940s, 
Well, yeah, you've managed to land a plague bomb in the middle of a field which someone visits maybe once or twice a day. Odd to that turning up in, in destroying the wider population or causing any trouble beyond some minor headlines is very, very low. If it even gets the headlines. Because the problem, the problem is, if it lands, let's say, just after they visited in the morning... Then by the time they might come around in the evening to check, or next day to check, it could well disperse enough that it's no longer lingering and strong enough for the thing to actually infect anyone. That's what I was asking. They had I-400 subs that could deploy them on LA or San Francisco. <sighs> That's not really a pragmatic option with the i400s, but it, it's a theoretical capability, I know, but I wouldn't really call it a pragmatic or practical capability compared to what the US could deliver, in theory. As Aaron Contreras says, free planes can't do much. Um, the UK had a plan to drop anthrax during World War II. Yes, they did. Wayne, don't look it up. You don't want to know. The Battle of Chesma? Well, how do I put this? It really should be, at every single point, a Russian win. Uh, no, a, a Turkish win. But it isn't. Mainly because... The Turks keep allying themselves... ...to be outmaneuvered. Yes, they don't seem to have that good a sailor... ...that well-trained a sailors and that sort of drill the crew, but... Honestly, they should have been able to do more. They should have been able to do more. And you'd think with 16 versus 9, well, you could form two squadrons of 8. And could have double teamed the, the Russians and gone down the, you know, basically divided up and managed to go either side of them. But they didn't. Take care, Amelia. Camper Down. Now, Camper Down is under the careless. And the reason is it's careless is because when a Dutch come out, they don't check their information. The Dutch are a really hardcore, strong naval force, still at this point, in 1797. And they come up with 15 ships of the line, 6 frigates, 4 brigs, and an aviso. Duncan has 16 ships of the line, 2 frigates, a sloop, 4 cutters, and a lugger. He managed to capture uh, managed to capture nine ships of the line and two frigates. They managed to capture the ships, including the Dutch flagship.
Now, to be fair, the British had gone through the Spithead and Nor mutinies, and all these things which had caused them issues. But, and I say this in the nicest possible way, the British fleet had been at a higher point of readiness before the battle began. They spent a lot more time at sea, and they had been doing a lot more operations. So, they have an advantage. The Dutch should have the advantage, because the Dutch are very well trained as well. And they have almost as many ships. They shouldn't certainly be not on a, a line to losing nine of their, six, nine of their 15 ships. I.e. the overwhelming majority of their force gets captured. But they do. A viso. Uh, Viso is a sort of small vessel. Sort of lines of a brig or cutter. Wayne's World of Science Technology. Topic, oh, totally off topic, but since Russians were involved in battle, I heard that the Slava class cruisers have no internal subdivision. No, they have internal subdivision. Hi, Paul. Apologies, those off while trying to sort out the new PC. Which, while checking for updates to Windows 10, installed Windows 11. It seems to be fine so far. Cross fingers. John Sykes. Makeup and a good hairstylist? Seriously? There is not enough makeup on this earth that can make this look any better. And as for a hairstylist, well... Yeah... That just seems cruel to the stylist. Ninety six hundred forty. Wayne's World Science Technology. Um, engines that are ten thousand hours past their maximum service life, however, definitely, and various other problems. There is a lot of lack of data going around about the Slavas. The Slavas are built on the generations of cruisers which have preceded them. They do have internal subdivision. It's different to an extent from Western one, but not that massively different. Most modern ships and most ships built since about 1950s rely on internal subdivision for their survivability versus missile strikes more than anything else. I am going to have to sort this light out at some point because it keeps hitting my eyes, which is why I keep closing my eyes because sort of light hits them. I'm... If I sit up better, it's less comfortable. I don't get to be as lazy, but it's better on my eyes with light. Ah, the capture of the Rosalie Squadron in 1808, and the Battle of Campeche. Campeche should enjoy quite a few of you. Now, the Rosalie Squadron, of course, is to, of course refers to Francis Rosalie's five ships of line and a frigate, 4,000 sailors, which were l sitting in Cadiz in Spain in June 1808. Now... The spring of 1808 had seen a deterioration in relations between Spain and France. This culminated in rebellions against Charles V and led to a French occupation and Joseph Bonaparte being placed on the Spanish throne. Right. Rosalie, under these circumstances, 
endeavoured to gain enough time for the arrival at Cadiz of French troops which had been dispatched from Madrid to Andalusia. He tried to take up a defensive position, he tried to put himself beyond reach of land battles in the channel which leads to La Caracaracha. Um, and then he offered to quit the bay in order to quiet the multitude. He next proposed to the British, who were blockading the port, um, to send his cannon ashore to keep his crews on board and conceal his uh, in a flag in exchange. Um, he was sort of wanted hostages uh, for his. Uh, from his sick, uh, so, you know, for the safety of his sick and for the French inhabitants of Cadiz, and pledged that he he should be and pledges that he should be safe from attack. The British didn't, of course, consent to this because the British were trying to hove off chunks of the French fleet as fast as they could. And then Tomas de Mole la Panchetto, uh, the Spanish, they say governor of Cadiz, but let's be honest, it's more local mayor senior officer sort of thing um, refuses to comply with their of these demands and requires that he surrender his forces when Rosary refused the Spanish sighted batteries on the Isles of um, Leon and near Fort Louis the ships in sitting in there were Neptune and Algeciras, both 80 guns, Heros, Pluton and Argonaut, 74, and Corneli, 44 guns. So, two second rates and three third rates. Roughly speaking. Oh. I will say also, this room is a lot warmer with the PC than it used to be. A lot warmer. I thought I was pronounced Campeche. Hmm. Campesh. Possibly. Mark Harkness, I was asking, got that backward. It was an American plan to bomb Japan with bat bombs. It was seriously studied for a while before we being dropped as unnecessary. Thank goodness it's full of bats. Mm-hmm. Right then. What happens on the 9th of June to the Roskilly Squadron is a division of Spanish gun and mortar boats and the batteries like the Leon and Fort Louis commence hostilities by opening fire. This was kept up till nightfall. The Spanish had even requested that two of their ships align, Prince de Osiris and Terribal, help them. A hundred uh, Prince of the Osiris, of course, is 112 guns, and Terrabal is 74. The following morning, the 10th, the carronade recommenced and went on till 2 p.m. when the Heros, the flagship, hoisted a flag of truce. Afterwards, Rossili addressed a letter to the Spanish governor Mora, offering to disembark his guns and ammunition, but to retain his men and not hoist any colours. These terms were considered unacceptable. The Spanish prepared to renew the attack on the French squadron with an increased force. On the 14th, at 7am, an additional battery of 30 long 24-pounders were ready to act, and numerous gun and mortar vessels took up their stations. The French ships struck their colours, which in the course of that morning were replaced by those of Spain. Admiral Collingwood, who commanded the blockade of Cadiz, was impatiently watching this and made an offer of cooperation. Its offer was refused by the Spanish. 
they wanted the British to just concentrate on preventing the French from escaping. They didn't want to give them, how to put it, the chance to claim the victory and claim the ships. After all, if the Spanish captured all these ships, they got five good ships for their fleet. Whereas if the British were involved in their capturing, well, the British might claim a couple of them for themselves. That's right, so don't worry, the bats had their revenge and burnt down an army base. I'm glad they did. good thing when you have an active chat, you have a lot of stuff going on, but then I have to catch up to make sure I'm answering all the questions. Mm-hmm. Right. So, Campesh, why is it careless? Well, on one side, you have the Republic of Texas... And the Republic of the Yucatan. Uh, Texas is led by Edwin Ward Moore. And Yucatan by James D. Boyland. Uh, Texas has a sloop of war, a brig, a, well, two schooners and five gunboats on their team. The Mexicans have Thomas Marin, who has three steamers, two brigs and two schooners. Now, it's kind of interesting because it included the Guadalupe, which is a Mexican schema, and the Montezuma, which were arguably two of the most powerful vessels of their day. Having been built by Jonathan Laird of Birkenhead for the Guadalupe, a even before Camel Lairds, built by the Lairds. And Montezuma was built by Green, Wiggums and Green at Blackwall. So they have some modern ships. Yet. Yet. It is a tactical draw slash strategic victory. As the Texan Yucatan forces managed to actually get the blockade of Campeche lifted. Mm -hmm. I am starting to yawn less now. I've got actually some cold air coming in here. The trouble. It's a lovely. This is a lovely. Lugar do make very nice offices, and it is a nice office. Although I have got to do some more painting on the outside because, as you can see, the wood does warp a bit, and there are some gaps between some of the woods, and slightly more gaps on the outside. So I've got to add some more painting on it. But it's an interesting battle because on April the thirtieth. The Texas and Yucatan force, which had been doing various operations in the Gulf of Mexico, decided to confront a small Mexican squadron consisting of sailing ships and a small steamer, the Regenerator. This battle lasted a few hours and was a draw, as both sides retire. The Texan ships went and rearmed. And on May the 16th, encountered a much stronger Mexican squadron, which included the modern... 878 ton, iron hulled, please note, not iron clad, iron hulled, 
paddle frigate Guadalupe and the wooden paddle frigate Montezuma. Each were armed with two 68 pounder Paxton's guns able to fire exploding shells. Commanded by British officers and manned by British and Mexican seamen. The battle went on for three hours. Three hours. And essentially is a draw. Both sides were drawing are sustaining considerable damage. The Texas ships were some physical damage, but Mexican and British sailors suffered much more in terms of casualties and wounded. Regenerator and its bad attendant squadron rejoined the Guadalupe and the Montezuma Flotilla on May the 19th, and they withdrew from the area. Texas squadron retired to Galveston. Claimed as heroes, and this was even though the president Sam Houston declared Commodore Moore and his ship's captains and the crew pirates for sailing against his wishes. Basically, the ship sailed against the president's wishes, Sam Houston's wishes, but when they came back and had done well. Well, Commodore Moore was acquitted for all charges at a court-martial of piracy, and um, it was felt that having fought an iron-hulled Mexican scheme ship and two others to a draw, using only wooden sailing vessel ships, was an achievement. And it's still to stay the only battle in history in which sailing ships held their own against steam-powered ships in combat. Hey, by gum. Explosive filled rats. Really? Mark Harness at Washington. 22. Could the U.S. have realistically pushed for the added tonnage to get Constellation converted in, along with Lexington and what, what in return from UK and Japan? I think they could have pushed for the tonnage. I think the British would have allowed it because... Well, let's be honest. Let's answer that question. Mm-hmm. Well, you need to have an extra 27,000 tons added to the treaty limits. So, basically, the treaty tonnage limits of 135,000 tons from memory would have to be more than that. The treaty limit would have to be about a hundred and... 155, 160, 162,000, which I doubt the British would go for. You would probably have to make it. What would the British want? They go for 23,000. 
and you have 7, that's 140,000, so you need 161. Yeah! Hundred and sixty five thousand tons the British might go in terms of a carrier allowance. You might actually see it pushed up to twenty seven uh, to more than that. It might be the British go, mm, yeah, we want more carriers. But that would be basically probably the criteria for watching Treaty. If you want to convert a third carrier, then the British would also want to convert three, in which case you also might get because I think their hulls are still going around at this point and haven't been scrapped, you probably get the free admirals as the conversions rather than courageous and glorious. So yeah, you'd probably be talking about a tonnage increase to 160-something thousand tonnes. I don't know about rats, but explosive disguised as a piece of coal, absolutely. Oh, well, everyone's disguised something as a piece of coal. Piece of coal is a fairly common thing to describe, to um, disguise the folks. I know someone who, because they have a coal fire in their house, has a coal store outside. So, guess what they had a bright idea for sticking their key in? Their spare key, so they could always get into their house. Into a piece of something that looked like a piece of coal. I knew this. But it was quite funny when someone who didn't know this was round at their house. Went and got coal and thought, oh, there's good. There's a bucket of coal already made up sitting to one side. Not realising that that artificially bucket of coal, the piece of coal which was literally just inside it, was the coal with the key inside. Took all that coal in, of course. Let's put it this way. Got the key back. But it didn't really, how do I put this? Look that clean afterwards. It did go in the fire. Because again, the bright spark had never loaded a coal fire before. And I do realise this is someone as like me who has to. Well, let's put it this way: every year when I'm caught, uh, when I run a certain A level and GCC revision summer camps, which are camps, not revision centres, they uh, it's an important thing to do. We do a campfire, and if there are no chemistry teachers there, I light the fire very well. If there are chemistry teachers there, and I want to get them involved, especially if I want to introduce the A-level tutors to the GCC students, I'll make a, uh, make a thing of doing lighting the fire badly and needing help. It's a skill. Unfortunately, my friend, when they were trying to use the coal, were not doing it badly out of that reason. Let's put it this way, the key required a lot of cleaning. A lot of cleaning. That's good. The ever popular, give me us every sparrow from a city as a peace offering, followed by tying a glowing ember to the sparrow's leg by a bit of wire and then letting them go back to their roosts and roofs. Ooh, that's always a popular one. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, the rat bomb is real and the British thing, as are fake coal lumps that were filled with explosives and were to be stuck into coal stockpiles for factories and trains in Germany. They failed to deliver them. Germans captured some examples and were freaked out, so they were checking the coal, which uh, slowed things down considerably more production. So you mean that it didn't matter? These were some of the things that didn't matter if they actually worked or not. The mere pr uh, idea that they were there would be enough to cause the disruption. Always useful when that happens.
Does the key still fit, though? Um, they didn't stay much longer in that house, so... It was a rental one. It was sad. So, Battle of Tashima. Right on. I'm just sitting there going, epic bombs of naval history, and the entire campaign, this entire campaign is an epic blunder of naval history. It is also an amazing feat of naval history, logistically, organisationally, the fact that they managed to get the fleet actually out to the Far East. And he still has binoculars by the time he gets there. Not sure how, but still does. To use is just amazing. But there are massive blunders. And I would say the biggest one is sending the fleet in the first place. Because just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And this fleet should not have been sent. This fleet is being sent to its doom. Okay? It's a stupid mistake. Stupid and careless. It's being careless of lives and the Navy you painstakingly built up. And the reason they're sent is to save national honour. Really? Or is it because you failed to actually reinforce positions you were going to need in wartime already there? You bit off more of an empire than you can chew. How often does Russia do that? Russia as a nation never do that. Unfortunately, Russia as a nation tend to be pretty darn unlucky with their leadership. They are very nice people, but they tend to get some really strange leaders. I was asking, could they turn back after Port Arthur was captured? Well, the trouble is with them turning back is once they're committed, it's very difficult for them to go home without it costing an absolute bomb. Honestly, diverting them back to the Black Sea Fleet and European waters would probably be insensible. But they don't. They carry on sending them. And This is going to be a loss of not just ships. This is going to be a loss of all the senior officers, all the personnel you've got there. Sailing them out there is great. Sailing them back? Mm hmm. Would have been more sensible than sailing them on after you lost Port Arthur. It is a good example of Russian history, and then it got worse. But it shouldn't have been. Because. Any sensible person should have looked at it and gone, mm, is this going to work? Let's put it this way. The lesson of the Battle of Tsushima is one of the reasons why the British are looking at their fleet operations the way they are for the war, a potential war against Japan in the Far East. The amount of times I have people go, well, you know, the British are planning on hopping up here and here and here up the south, uh, up sort of the Asian coast and taking place on their way, and can they really do that, etc. That's a, actually quite a conservative methodology. It's basically take a point, consolidate, build up, take the next point, consolidate, build up, take the next point, consolidate, build up, take the next point, consolidate, build up. It won't be quick, but it will work. It's basically a slow-moving steamroller, and Japan will be the tarmac. There is no real chance for winning against that scenario, because every time the British come forward, they'll come forward in sufficient force that it's going to require your whole fleet. In which case, you eventually end up in having a, fleet ba a big fleet battle, and maybe you win the first one, but do you win the second one, or the third one, or the fourth one? 
Because that's the other reality. The British will keep building ships and will keep coming. The trouble is, Toshima goes too well for the Japanese and suddenly they expect almost... It's kind of like the Battle of Trafalgar. The amount of times people go, well, why weren't the British happy with this victory? Because it was another Trafalgar. That's honestly it. It's not another Trafalgar. It needs to be a Trafalgar for the British to take notice of it. Aaron Contreras, do the Russia-Japanese battles Yamato like to split up his forces, just like his predecessor? Well, yes, due to that, both battles he did like to split up his forces like his predecessors. But that was also, in many ways, a necessity of function. It's kind of like, well, we will talk later probably about the Battle of Denmark Strait. And the amount of times I have people go... Well, what they should have done is they should have kept the fleet concentrated and kept Victorious and King George V with Hood and Prince of Wales. And you go, yes, but then you can only be in one place at a time. And you're covering for a surface. You're covering against a surface radar, which is theoretically a single capital ship. Theoretically, at least on paper, it's a sensible decision to a divide up your force and b you send your most experienced ship with your least experienced ship to even out the experience and you send your middling experienced ship with your carrier so that your carrier is safe it makes sense it's sensible to divide your forces under those circumstances uh, turning uh, Tuning three four three four. Trafalgar's a bit of a of an appar. I don't think you mean arbitration. I think aberration is what you mean. Considering they ever before or ever have reached efficiencies like that, there have been battles where it's reached efficiencies like that. We've talked about it. The Battle of Iconos um, wasn't mentioned earlier. It was pretty much like that. But again, it needs. It depends on the disparity of force in terms of training experience. John Mack, the entire Russo Japanese war shouldn't have been something the Russians fought and fought it. No, the Russians needed to fight the Russo Japanese war because they needed that to rebuild their army and work out how to re re turn them into a modern army. But um, shame it wasn't actually finished in time by the time World War One happened. But it did was one of the reasons why they were able to mobilize so quickly. They almost caught the Germans on the hop. But saying that the Russo Japanese war. The Russians were primarily prepared for a land war, and they should have focused on it. Mark Harkness. Uh, in terms that, that they were had humiliated great power and got away with it, it helped um, set a mindset that would happen with USA. Yes, of course, though, they forgot the fact that they humiliated a great power while being allied with the greater power at the time, who basically limited others' involvement. Because if this fleet going there to fight the Japanese, and this is the Japanese squadron, if I remember in this picture, had been Franco-Russian, you'd have been dealing with a very different fleet. For starters, the fleet combined fleet would have pulled in into French Indochina. It would have pulled in, rearmed, recalled, stocked itself up, Left its so slower supply ships and areas of vessels behind, probably in a mo probably in everything that was too slow for the fleet to actually get involved in a fleet action, and the combined Franco-Russian fleet would have then moved north, and you'd have a combined French, a Franco-Russian force engaging the Japanese. You'd have had more ships on the Russian side on in the Russian force. You would have had a large and far more firepower being brought to bear. Would the Japanese have won with their tactics? Potentially, they still would have won. Would it have been as great a victory? Probably not. Because at a certain point, the firepower and sheer numbers of the force they'd be facing would have told. And also the fact the condition of those ships after they'd stopped in Indochina 
and repaired and refreshed themselves and got everything ready for battle. It would have probably been a two to three day stand down in Indochina, resting up, rebuilding, repairing, sorting themselves out. But it would have been worth it. Wayne's World of Science Technology, you get better by honestly reviewing the past. If you don't, you can't improve. Mm, yeah. There are various ways you can get better. One of them is by making a mistake. One of them is by putting information out. Another sort of learning is always a good way. Uh, currently, there's a sort of debate going on on my Discord channel about the Abruzzi class and their displacements. Because... I put out facts and figures which I don't believe to be true, but they are the ones I could find repeated most often in more, most of the sources. But there are other sources with differentials. And to give you an example of the discussion, which is going on, with various nice people on Discord. Oh, good lord, I can get into Discord while live. This is amazingly different. Um... There is a fact is that we know that the Abruzzi and Garibaldi were roughly 8,800 tons when they were completely empty. We don't really know their standard displacement, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was roughly 10 to 11,000 tons, and I think their full displacement was probably a little bit more than that. Because we do know, for example... Their stand displacement included things like, well, roughly 2,267 tons of liquids alone. So, that's 2,267 tons of liquids. That's before you add in ammunition. The, the six-inch shells alone would equal roughly 150 tons. All these things add in. But I still use those figures... Because one of the ways I found us learning as a academic and as a lecturer sometimes is by putting out the figures I have and seeing what other people come back through with their research. It's a way of learning. That sort of visibly, that's sort of a technique which is called visible mistake learning. It's not really that often used, but I like to use it occasionally because it. I feel it also engages with the people, with the wider YouTube naval history community quite well, and I like engagement and chatting away in the comments, and I like the comment response videos because I think they're a good way of having an interaction, and that's why I do a lot of this history stuff. With the Battle of Toshima, the the whole force has been sent out there is basically mistake learning and the Russians, the mistake is you lose the vast majority of your fleet. That's just not sensible. Tony three four three four. do you consider Holland could have won Denmark straight or was this mutual retreat the best to be quoted? Oh no, he could have won it. A couple of lucky shell hits from his 15-inch guns on Hood, or not uh, not having the same problems with the turrets of Prince of Wales as she did have, and things could have been very different. You know, Prince of Wales could have hammered away very hard with her 14-inch guns. There is still on paper there is eight 15-inch and four uh, and 12. No, eight 15 inch and 10 14 inch guns in that battle on the British side versus eight 15 inch guns. That's a lot of damage that should have been could have been caused. When you actually have an engagement 
when Bismarck is sunk, it's versus nine 16 inch guns and 10 14 inch guns. That's what sinker. That's not that much different. I'm sorry. There is difference. I do admit there is difference there. But the thing is, yeah, they, the, the force sh uh, did have the adv ability to perhaps sink her. And yes, Hood is a battle cruiser. She is a battlecruiser, not a Faust battleship, a battlecruiser. But that doesn't mean in that scenario where it's not a line. My point is always with battlecruisers versus battleships is that the battlecruiser is in trouble versus a battleship when they're in a line engagement and they can't maneuver and they can't use their speed. I do sometimes wonder looking at Denmark Straits whether. Whether it was sensible to keep them together as a division, or whether they Holland should have signalled act independently. Because you've got two V one. Act independently. Yes, if you're acting as a division at those ranges, it does make firing, it does make spotting splashes and not being confused easier. But acting independently would allow Hood to work at her speed and Prince of Wales to work at her speed, if that makes sense. Shomak, it's relatively simple to be a military genius when your opposite number is a moron, or with an exhausted force. If Radatsky had been uh, a bit, had, had a port to R&R, the Russians would have been neither. It is true. If Radatsky had had such a, a, a such a uh, such a scenario as said, French Indochina, it would have been different. He'd also had a French fleet with him, and a French admiral, and that would have given him all sorts of other ships as an as an advantage. But that was never going to happen because the British were involved and they limited things. Well, it's not a wrong answer per se, as I'm not sure figures are completely off that they give for these things for the bruisies. But I just don't think those are necessarily the accurate figures. But they're the mo they're the ones I've seen most commonly in the sources available, so I use them, and I do know things like um, Whitley's cruisers, and sort of all those things of the Second World War, and it does have different figures in it. But the majority seem to be using those figures, so I gave them. I had to a few less issues of Prince of Wales' 14 inch guns could have buff a butterfly into them causing some damage that prevents Bismarck's lucky shot. Yeah. If a 14 inch shell had hit either of the. any of her. of Bismarck's turrets, that could have caused all sorts of trouble for that turret to operate. Calm goes right. On the other hand, if Bismarck had knocked out its radar, had its radar knocked out, but knocked out the trailing cruiser's radar, well, then it would have to concentrate its fire on the cruiser, wouldn't it? Rather than on Hood or Prince of Wales, which would have avoided a lucky shot and kept Hood and Prince of Wales firing at them. That's for sure, 16 18 inch guns wouldn't have gone amiss. It's not the 18 inch guns which you have to worry about the counties, it's the torpedoes. Let's take it through one. Correct me if I'm wrong, but if Hood got four triple 15 inch, wouldn't they make that make the RN to get more confident and go with triple turrets? It would have done, and it would have given them a working triple turret design to build their options for. And they did look at it, uh, but it would have made Hood probably the most powerful warship in the world. 
12, 15 inch guns, let's be honest, there would not have been anything. At that point, building something with 12, 15 inch guns only guarantees that the Americans decide they have to complete something with 12, 16 inch guns. The Americans would have to complete something bigger. And you can't do that on 35,000 tons. So, all it would have done is increase Hood's weight because you'd have had to have 50% more tonnage for guns and ammunition. And that's going to affect turret weight, etc. as well, but not by the same amount. You'd have to have more weight for machinery to maintain the speed. More space for fuel, etc. to actually keep the range and speed you want. And it would have ended up being a bigger ship. But it could have been done. That's what, maybe wrong was the wrong word, but method works well. Incorrect, or I'm not quite sure about this one. I did mention in the recorded video that I wasn't quite sure about it. I did say I have iffy, I find it iffy. I have to say I find the full load figure iffy, and etc. Uh, it's just, you're talking about ships which have more engine power than, a ta than an Edinburgh class. Similar firepower to a town class cruiser in terms of their six inch guns and other fit, and have an armor fit which is not far off a town class cruiser and all sorts of other things, and yet apparently they are thousands of ton less in fully loaded. And he's sitting there going, How? The Italians are not as good at shipbuilding as the British. They do not use as much river, as much welding as the British do. They're not as good at welding. They're not as good at. They're having to do more riveting. They're having to all sorts of things which add weight onto a ship's hull. They have to do, and yet apparently we're supposed to believe that these ships are massive. Uh, these sh very complicated ships are built so much more efficiently than the British. They're a lot, lot lighter, fully loaded. I'm not sure I agree with that one. If memory serves, Bismarck straddled the trading cruiser Sheffield, which fled into a fog wall the day before the, uh, the, uh, the Battle of Denmark Strait. The battle might not have happened, at least not then and there. Um, I think she, it was later on in the campaign that she straddled the Sheffield. Because I don't think the Sheffield was part of the following her yet. It was one of the counties. And there was another county there already. So there were two counties following her. So even if you manage to deter one of them, the other one's going to keep up with you. Hello, VCH. I do love the fact that Lexington and Saratoga were both technically 35,000, over 35,000 tons by a significant margin. Schumach, also, we know that the British definitely didn't cook the books in any way their cruisers. Oh, yeah. No, never. The British would never cook the books. At all. We're, we're far too honest and gentlemanly like. There seems to be a lot of people who are sort of... Hmm. Fourth, Ken, Ken, Ken George V appears to the conning tower. 40 inches is not a bad gun, and Prince of Wales could have had a big impact in Denmark's right. Here is the thing. If the quadrupled gun had worked, turret had worked, 
And they managed to get 12 14 inch guns on those ships. Then we would be talking a very different scenario about the King George V because there'd be, your option would be 9 16 inch guns or 12 14 inch guns. And the rate of fire you can achieve a 14 inch gun versus a 16 inch gun and other things, especially when you've got a quadruple turret would probably have led them to... I don't think they'd have called the British King George V the machine gun battleships. But I think there would have certainly been a very different rationale on their size, etc. if they managed to get away with it. And I think, honestly, to make it work... And this is going to sound terrible, but this is my... My mental maths on the subject has always been that if the limit had been at 40,000 tonnes you would have found the British would have managed to get away with having uh, three quadruple turrets and they probably would have worked because they'd have been able to have had just that much more tonnage space and t uh, displacement space, etc. under standard for to fit in uh, turret machinery and get those turrets really working. Books are not cooked. They may have been stored in the coal bunker. Oh, what a shame. Can't quite read those displacement figures anymore. Well, I'm sure we're within limits. Yep. VCH, blunders. The career of Yi Shen Xin. Uh, Yi Shen Shi. Uh, Shin is uh, full of blunders against him from both enemies without and within. Oh, yes. That's it. Considering if one of Hood's Mark IVs had found Bismarck's rudder, how far can Bismarck go with rudder jam straight ahead before she runs into trouble? Not far. Not far at all. I'm not... As said, I've admitted before, I'm not the biggest fan of the 14-inch gun. I think the British should have gone with a 15-inch gun. And the reason I think the British should have gone with a 15-inch gun is then you could have upgraded all the other 15-inch guns. And you would have ended up with nine 15-inch guns. And because you've already got a triple turret available for, uh, that you designed, that you worked out for the 16-inch guns, you could have used pretty much the same turret off Rodney and Nelson which you've already worked out all the problems with, so you could have gone with a turret which worked, and you could have made ships which had nine 15-inch guns. And the new 15-inch gun would have been able to something you could have upgraded to the Queen Elizabeth class, the R class, everyone could have upgraded it. Would have been interesting. If you'd been really sensible, and really thought it through, you might have even decided to upgrade Renown when she was under... Because her hull's probably the best fitted to do it. Could have upgraded her and modified her to have treble 15-inch gun turrets in her gun system. So she'd have ended up with nine 15-inch guns as well. As your prototype when she was going through her rebuild. Right. So, didn't sort of see. Wouldn't you say Prince Wells did have a significant on Bismarck having damaged the fuel tank? Mm, she had an impact, certainly. Um, Colonel Fergusberg, how would a 40,000 ton nail rod look like? Probably not 40,000 tons, but they probably would have been. Let's put it this way the British would probably kept ra broadly similar design, three guns forward, three turrets for it, uh, forward. Maybe have gone with the F form. And the reason they had gone with the F, which had the raised C turret rather than the raised B turret with the extra length that provided, is because that would also allow for more fuel to be carried, etc., and more space at the back for engines, and you could have got them up to far speeder. Because basically, the British were happy with the firepower, happy with an all-forward arrangement. What they would have liked them to be would be faster. So if you'd had that extra tonnage, you'd have probably sort of... Uh, the British would probably aim for a ship with about 25... Well, how do I put this? With an a uh, with an a, a, a an aim for speed of greater than twenty five knots, maybe even would have pushed for the twenty eight knots, but probably twenty uh, rather not the tw they wouldn't have set off for twenty three knots. They'd have gone faster. Um, it might have been twenty six. It might have been twenty eight. And they would have probably been the first fast battleships. Either way, you would have had a very different World War Two because. 
Nice and Al would have probably been caught by Rodney, in which case Nice and Al would have been sunk. In which case Sharnhorst would have probably been in for reconfiguration, and it might have changed the entire course of war. Nice second, it is far it is far then while it's waiting for a head on course. It's not gonna be fun if she's going in a straight line. Come guys, re fifteen inch mark two. Was to be L forty five instead of L forty two, but high ninety sometimes instead of a hundred ton of sons? Yes. That's good. Also, the cramped 16 inch turret would probably have been more comfortable with 3 15 inch guns. Yep. I don't know. Oh, Renown, maybe getting a triple 15 inch turret. Is there really enough room in the barbette for the ex that extra kit? Considering the rebuild they did on Renown, they could probably have got away with doing it. Tony Free for I blame Dr. Clark for Renown Repulse changing from mare ships to Queens of the Interwar in World War II, in my opinion. They are good looking ships. If I had redesigned the King Girls Fifth, I would have ditched the plane, two flammable, just to have a cruiser along, ditched the 5 inch 25s for 4.5 inch twins, and the 9 15 inches, or failing that, 12 14 inches. I agree with ditching the plane, and I agree with going with the 4 5s. Honestly, it would have been made a lot easier in terms of supply. So, let's talk about them stupid. Dardanelles campaign. Why is it stupid? Because if you're going to send enough force anyway, then you've got to do it properly. And as I've been over the Darnell's campaign a few times, if you are going to try and do what is in effect a charging of the lines through minefields, then you had to build a World War I equivalent of a, mi of a, f a fire ship to get through the minefields. So your options are either to have ships which are loaded with explosives, which you charge up to the mine f minefields and detonate to try and blow up and at least disrupt the mines, which is an option, and a World War One equivalent of a fire ship, or alternatively, you take some of those pre-dreadnoughts before they get sent. You actually apply some thought. You see, you give them a you give them massive bulges. You fill up with I don't know whatever you want a cork and seal for any of the forward compartments you don't need on the ship so it's as fl as it's it's as floating as possible without the ability to take in water and you bash your way through you literally have two rows so eight pre knots charging along like that The Darnell's campaign, you are putting all this effort in to try and do this, then do it properly. Don't go in half-cocked, tell the enemy you're coming, then withdraw, and then come back and go again. It's just stupid. It's a, it's a massive blunder. Because it could have worked if it had been done properly. Moon sound. Well, it's not careless from the Russian perspective, but it is from the German perspective. The Battle of Moon Sound, yes, it's a victory. But it's not a victory which they really fought through. Because the Russians start off with two pre dreadnought battleships, three cruisers, three gunboats, 21 destroyers, and three submarines. They lose a pre dreadnought, they lose a destroyer, and they lose a submarine. The Germans start off with a battle cruiser, 10 battleships, 9 light cruisers, a mine cruiser, 50 destroyers, and 6 submarines. They lose 2 dreadnoughts damaged, a torpedo boat sunk, and 7 mine supers sunk. Why do they lose this? What happens? Well, it's quite simple. They are deploying the bare minimum of force. And when one deploys the bare minimum of force, when you have more available, you get into trouble. Honestly, what would have been sensible for the Germans to do? Well, you've got the high seas fleet. Send it. 
yeah, it's not going to be able to do anything in the North Atlantic, but it's not doing much in the North, North Sea or North Atlantic at this point anyway. So, might as well send it up. Send all the ships you have available. Push, uh, storm through the Russian positions. Blast them up. Don't get it. Don't suffer any casualties. And certainly don't lose the number of ships you lost to this thing. I said forty. I would have thought Bismarck would have had better luck with differential shaft speeds of steerage with the rudders jammed, str jammed straight ahead. Do you disagree? I think it would have made her life easier on, to a certain extent, but the trouble is differential shaft street speeds on the Bismarck were not exactly the easiest thing to govern because of the way the shafts were set up. It would have certainly been steered more. I think the thing is if she'd been damaged that much at Denmark Strait, she'd probably turn back sooner. She'd probably turn back then. If she'd been torpedoed in the Ben battle, she'd turn back then. But I will add this. I think if Norfolk and Suffolk had managed to get involved in the fight, the counties, it would have been torpedo time. And that is the problem for Bismarck and your, uh, Prince Eugen. If the torpedoes come in... They can cause severe damage, and not just a rudder. They could damage a lot more than a rudder. Because if you if you've got a spread of, if they fire eight torpedoes from each uh, each salvo, it's not going to be good for you. They don't list the torpedoes, but I'm fairly sure candy classes had torpedoes. Yeah, they had eight 21-inch torpedoes in two quad mounts. They removed from 1935 onwards, but not all of them had them removed. And the thing is, if I'm not sure if those two did still have theirs, did they or didn't they? Because that would have made a difference. Dang, where's a town class where you need it? That would have certainly be had that. That little torpedo farm would definitely have been there firing its torpedoes. Ooh, I've got a new patron. Thank you, Leslie. That's for sure. I would have called the Darnells careless rather than stupid. No. The reason it's it's stupid rather than careless is because honestly they thought they'd still win without doing any preparations, so that makes it stupid. When you underestimate your enemy to that extent, and you underestimate the situation to that extent, and you are that disorganized, and you try you give your enemy that much notice you're coming, it is stupid. Shumak, is there any that greater than the name of London than the French designers who were given the Riku class and decided that their follow-on should be the same number of turrets, but with one fore and one aft? Uh, life happens. Gugland, what happens if Kerry Xamarin managed to upgrade the guns on Shannos before unleashing Bismarck? Well, that could have been interesting, because you could have had more than the Bismarck coming up. But you must remember, this is the thing. If... How do I put this politely? Okay, so. Let's say Bismarck comes out, and she's got Nice now with her, because she was the first one being sent in for it. Anyway. And they both have 15-inch guns. At that point, will the British be operating in sets of two? Because set, do sets of two give you a superiority over a single... over two ships? No. Immediately, the British will start thinking in terms of threes and fours. So, you would no longer have Hood and Prince of Wales going off on their own. There would be Hood, Prince of Wales, and King George V, and Victorious operating together as a task force. 
So that would be what would be hunting her down. You would also probably have another task force formed, probably around... Where is Furious at this point? Uh, I'm not sure, but probably Furious... Probably... Because you'd want at least two task forces. Where's Rodney? Rodney would be the one. Uh, Furious, Rodney... Renown... She's somewhere available at this point. Sort of available. And an R-Class. Would be got together. That would be your other force. So you would have two of these forces. And they one will be backstopping. The, the secondary Rodney one will be backstopping. And that would be the forces out there. Because the British are not going to get themselves in a scenario where they are dealing, they are trading against the Germans in even number of ships. The British don't need to get into that scenario. Or have more they can call upon. They will call upon them. Dan Freeman. Renowned as Ark Royal in May 1941 as Force H was around Gibraltar. Yes. Ark Royal might have actually been called up as well. I've put it, I've had, well, the sea is, renowned in this position is she's the one that she can most, she's the fastest ship that can be called in to the, to the backup force. That's why I picked on renowned. But they could bring up Ark Royal as well. They could bring Force H up as one of the hunting forces. So it could be Home Fleet and Force H up hunting them. As original as actually ended up happening at one point. Go land, triple fifteen is not a battle cruiser. Again, it's not armament which design defines a battleship versus a battle cruiser. It's hull structure. It's purpose they built it for its engine density versus armor dense armor in terms of armor coverage the armor belt will often be the same thickness but it won't cover the same proportion of the hull take care jimmy nice no, how the shaft set up that, that difficult to govern oh I forget it was, but it, uh, what it was, but it was the gearbox and gearing which the Germans were using meant that actually use it, doing that wasn't how do I put this? It was they they had engines which were not let's. <sighs> okay. I think it's to do with the blade design, the bla the, the on the gearing the. The way they lock together and the way the, the shafting is all set up to gear and transfer and evolve the power in the turbine and the gearbox. Oh, what was it? Think of the word, think of the word, think of the word. Sorry, this looks like real stupid, but this is literally what I'm doing, trying to think of the word. The grooving. The grooving on the tongues. It's designed for a very efficient, but... It's designed for maximum horsepower can transfer, not maximum torque, if that makes sense. So it's not as good at providing the differential. Is that right? I think that's right, but I might need to go and check. I know I'm, I know I'm right for some reason, but I'm not sure if I'm saying the right reason why or getting it right. Brismont's hull form and free shaft configuration they different a differential steering practically impossible. Same thing with slow speed manoeuvring in port. Use tugs or get stuck or run aground. That is another problem. You do basically have to turn off one shaft and the central shaft and it's sort of less effective on that way, but it's also the gearing will sort of impact as well. 
Grigland, also, nobody friend, uh, fretted, li treaded lightly around Repulse and Renown, no matter they having less guns than Hood or Queen Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. Actually, sure, would it have been worth the RN trying to rustle up what tribals they could have to so that Prince Wales and Hood actually had an escort? Um, the thing is, the tribals were all off doing other things. That's the thing. The tribals were off doing other things. Uh, the were, tribals were escorting King George V and Victorious. So the tribals were there with them, or with that fleet, because, again, this is the thing. We only have one battleship. We have an aircraft carrier, but we have one capital ship with this group. Where are the tribal destroyers, therefore? They're with, who are they with King George V and Victorious? Because that adds on to that group's firepower and that group's potential operational. Where are the other ones? They're off escorting a convoy in Africa, off the coast of Africa. So that's the trouble. That's why you don't have enough for there, because the British need to use them for other operations. Wayne's World of Science Technology. Do you really detect racism at work with Darnells and Toshima? Yes. Well, not so much. It's going to sound strange. It's, it is a version of racism, but it's not racism. It's more a case of inherent superiority of the Western race that they must be able to win this battle. It's a sort of egotism as much as racism. So anyway, how would the war change if all the R-Class would be refitted? If you managed to refit all the R-Class to Royal Oak Standard prior to World War II, without affecting the impact of refitting of the other ships, um, they'd have certainly been a lot more capable. It might well have been a case of... You'd have had a few more R-Class around for operations. And you'd have been that much more confident in your second line battleships that you would have been more able to risk your first like, front line battleships and things. Take care, Wayne. Gagland, that's a problem, though. Who is left searching them when they eventually break out? Hmm. Hello, Glenstrip. Um, Gagland, can you rephrase that question? Because there, there needs to be slightly more information there for me to know what I'm answering. If, uh, no, Sigrun, if Bismarck and Jürgen are being shot at by Mark 8 and Mark 4 torpedoes, some will get through. Probably. Wouldn't expect it to be efficient, merely significantly more than incapable. Which I understand the case to be when the rudder was jammed over to one side or the other. Yes, it was, but that was also because that then limited the amount of power you could put on to any engine. Again, your free engine configuration, free shaft configuration, wasn't exactly the most helpful in that scenario. Cameron, Doc, when you say are talking about like, putting triple fifteens on around, could you have done the same to Queen Elizabeth, dropping one turret for engine deck and giving you one more gun and a higher top speed at the end? Not really. The Renowns are battle cruisers, and there's a difference in their structure enough that you can get away if you're prepared to spend the money with doing it. The Queen Elizabeths, if you went back to the beginning when they were first built. You could, that certainly is a way which I think you could have achieved the 28 knot goal. And kept the, kept the number of guns you wanted. And actually, well, as I said, it had an increased number of guns.
Bishon, how did the upgraded Royal Oak compare to the standard class of USN battleships in the 7th and afterwards? Um, it's probably com comparable to the upgraded ones for them. What is it? Yes, now I do remember it for the engines. Oh, of course, they had the same engine issues. Right, so. The way the gearbox and the system on the Bismarck, etc. is designed, it's designed to be very efficient for cruising speeds. It's not very good for low speeds. This is one of the reasons why, combined with the free shuttle arrangement, that they need tugboats and they need doses, that they need the support they need when they're going doing inshore manoeuvring and going into and out of harbour. This is another reason why when you're trying to do the close-in rev management, you would need to do differential shaft manoeuvring. It makes it it's very, very difficult because it's not designed to be managed in that sort of micromanaging way. And you can do it, but because you have to do it with a slightly bigger differentials on your engine on the engines, it makes it more of a you, you you can't, it's not, uh, when I say inefficient, it elongates every turn. So instead of you turning, you're doing, sort of like that. So that's the problem. If you have the turret, ja uh, the rudder jam center line, you would have to, let's see, which... You might well have to also turn off the central, sh uh, t uh, cut the central shaft from working at all, as well, because if you're having you're trying to do differential steering, the central shaft is just going to exaggerate any configurations. So you have to turn that off. You're going to you can only use the outer shafts, and it's all going to affect your top speed. It's going to affect your maneuvering. It's basically going to make you a sitting target anyway. Right, into war years. The biggest mistake I could find. If you're going to cheat, and this is for everyone, cheat properly. Okay? Everyone cheated on the treaties. To a greater or lesser extent. Cheat properly. There's also a decision for 11-inch guns here, but there again, without the 11-inch guns in the Deutschland class vessels, you wouldn't have the 11-inch guns for Scharnhorst and Eisenau, and you wouldn't have had the money and funding going into large gun programs, which provided an industry that could support the 15-inch guns, which were built for Bismarck and Tirpitz. So without them, you wouldn't have had any German capital ships in World War II. You just wouldn't have. So they are necessary from a strategic perspective, but they themselves are, if you're going to cheat, to cheat properly. And the reason I say this is quite simple. Okay, you've got a triple 11-inch turret. That's good. If you're going to build them in this configuration, they should have probably built them as mini Shan horse and with three triple 11-inch guns. And yes, I know someone is going to turn up and go... But, 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 the treaties, that's true. However, these are to replace pre-dreadnoughts. They are allowed to be upgun versions of that, and to an extent, therefore, they're not considered, they, are, they can argue they're not limited by the treaties in terms of being escorts. And there's also the fact that if they did build them as that, would anyone really want to start a war over Germany building something with 9 11-inch guns when the Royal Navy has ships going around which have 9 16-inch guns? Probably not. No one would start a war over it. But you have lots of other decisions going around where people just, if you're going to lie, lie properly. Do something worth lying about.
Gagaland, if all four of the county capital ships in the home fleet needed to go out, that is exactly the counties and towns would be out searching just as they were. Gogolander, that's exactly who were out searching for the Germans. It was the counties and towns. The 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 capital ships were guided in by the counties and towns. The capital ships weren't searching for Bismarck and Prince Eugen. They were in their positions waiting for their getting moving to intercept based on information coming from the cruisers and coming from searching aircraft. And Freeman, thinking of treble versus twin turrets, do you buy the turret efficiency effect of this rule of thumb? I think I've given you all the rule of thumb in that I have said that if one turret is this many problems, a twin turret has twice as many problems, a triple turret has four times as many problems, quadruple turret has... Eight times as many problems. Keeps going up and doubling every time. So, yeah, this is why a triple turret is probably the balance I would go for. But the British are used to go for going for the twin turret because they were relying on numbers of ships as well. The Royal Richard, I quite like the Deutsch ones. I realise they're quite essentially interwar versions of pre-dreadnoughts, but they're fun to look at. They are fun to look at. I do agree. I think, frankly, that you have an interesting thing with their diesel engines. I think that they should have been made... They sh it would have been better to design them to be slightly faster. And I said, I would have gone with triple turrets. Triple, free triple, uh, free triple turrets. Mario 640, were the triple lemon inch turrets also used as shore batteries? I think there were a few uses of the shore batteries. Senator, those hundred tons of, uh, for the captain's wine storage is necessary to lie in the treaty. He needs it because of the Admiralty stupid, Admiral stu Admiral's, uh, stupidity. To be fair, for most ne and most uh, people writing treaties, they let that pro that past. Um, Irons, isn't the biggest blunder of the war interwar period that they didn't get everyone involved in the treaties and left half the people out? That is a blunder, yes. But it would also would have complicated the treaties quite dramatically. If you got South America involved, if you got Russia in the treaties, if you got Germany into the treaties, you could have won something. But you'd also overcomplicate it, and you'd have probably ended up, for the Americans and the British at least, increasing the number of ships you'd have to build. Because the French and Italians wouldn't accept the same amount of limitations as are imposed on X, Y, and Z. The Russians would probably want to match with the Japanese, which the Japanese might not accept, even though the Russians couldn't build up to match the Japanese, and would have to have a fleet in the Baltic, in the Black Sea, and in the Far East. Which would mean the Japanese would want more ships. Uh, the French and the Italians would then be upset and competing for more ships. You have the Germans involved... They would want more ships than the French would want more ships than the Germans and the Italians combined. And then you'd have the South American powers involved and you'd have the whole Brazil, Chile, Argentina rivalry taking place again. It's just you can a treaties can go the other way. Whilst people always say getting more people involved does make things better by making it more inclusive and will have therefore a wider impact and more people buy in, that's true. But it also makes actually getting the treaty more difficult. So the more people you have involved, actually the less likely it is that a treaty is actually enacted.
I too, many Sharnos in the late 1920s might also result in some allowance for supercruisers in the 19 London Treaty if the UK public is spooked enough. Mm, probably would have had an impact on the London, second London Treaty more than the first London Treaty, so the 1936 one. And if that has an allowance for supercruisers, then that's probably got something built by World War II, because the British, being the British, would turn around and build it. Tom saying, uh, how about so it's on the Deutschland? How about a ship with the same engine type plus speed, three triples? How big would that? Smaller than Shans, but how much? Basically, if you look at this space here uh, for the forward turret up above me, and Probably it would be two turrets forward, one aft. Well, that would be the sensible configuration. We do know Germans some, at times sometimes go for two aft, one forward, but we'll leave that to one side. Uh, you would be talking about increasing the hull by a, in length by about the length of a turret. A bit more to add some base for its movement. But yeah, that'd be the factor. <laughs> That's good. I would add the League of Nations is a pretty big interwar blunder. I wouldn't say the League of Nations is an interwar blunder. I'd say the League of Nations is an interwar mistake, a blunder, in, to an extent, well, not a blunder, but is undermined fatally by various nations not being involved. And whether or not that's a blunder depends on whether or not you believe those nations actually wanted the League of Nations to succeed. Dusty, you have been graced with the presence of Fissel, the even larger than normal orange cat. Hello, Fissel. So anyway, I wonder what the treaty powers would do if the Atlanteans, random country, built four Yamato-sized vessels on a support fleet. Um, panic attack. But then they'd uh, just activate the escalator clause. Mark Agnes, I find an odd parallel between the Deutschlands and the US Superfrigates, and Germany should have guessed the solution to their ships was the same as the Superfrigates. Packs the smaller ships. Yep. Bishop, we need a UAD video on free triple 11 inch Panzer Sheath. We might get one soon, because I think with this computer I can probably record a decent one. Uh, no, so, yeah, the Renowns and Hood will always be an obstacle British large cruiser, and we've seen this cheaper than building a new ship from scratch. Actually, no, because let's put it this way. For the British, if you've got an allowance for a supercruiser to build a, a 9.2 inch or something X supercruiser, that's a useful force multiplier because that means you can, it's going to sound terrible this, but if you're affording that to be the really fast ship, you can no longer have to worry about King George. Uh, the, you can make a different change in your design to the King George V. If you can build a 9.2 inch cruiser that's fast, designed to catch the Deutschlands, let me go back to this, then perhaps you can get you can lie a bit about the top speed of your 14 inch uh, your um, King George the fifths and their exact power and you can do some interesting things about spaces not being for fuel honestly they're being they're just for air they're not for fuel and get your free quadruple 14 inch guns because you now have a cover of it 
I can record a decent um, UAD video without the juttering that sometimes appears on them with this one. I could live stream UAD. I don't, I'm possibly, but I, 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 I wouldn't like to try it just yet. Now, World War II. Okay, I'm taking both from the Pacific. Why? Because I can. There are plenty of ones, and I knew I was going to end up talking about Denmark Straits, whatever happened. So I decided not to bother with putting that in. And I thought, stupid. Well, the Japanese build super battleships, not to, in order to try and deter conflict, really, when you look at it. Yes, you can say it's to win the battles, but let's be honest, you're building the biggest and the best you can build. So that also you can deter the enemy, you can overrule them, you can show the power of your state. Well, that only works if they know about it. Here is the real nutshell of why submarines are not so good at deterrence. Because, and this is conventional deterrence from strategic deterrence. Strategic deterrence is when a submarine is based on the fact you don't know where it is, so you know it can launch. So therefore, you know that you, you, the nuclear weapons are survivable, so you don't want to go there. Conventional deterrence is based on someone being able to give you a, deliver a threat without making it sound like a threat. So, if you turn to someone and you go, we have a nuclear submarine off your coast. That's a threat. However, if hell, oh, one of our frigates is sailing past... And we haven't said anything, but uh, the ambassador is going. Oh, one of our frigates is going to be sailing past. Would you? Could would she come for a port visit? That's not a threat. It has the same connotations. We have a ship in the area, and we're paying attention to what's going on. But it's not a threat. It shows interest. It shows we are paying attention. And we can pay attention very closely if we need to, but it's not a threat. Saying, we have the world's largest, most powerful battleship, sprushing all the newspapers, and then watching the Americans, the British, and probably the Germans as well, all scramble to build their own equivalents because they are so upset that someone else has something bigger and more powerful than them, would have bought the Japanese time. Yes. The Americans would still have been doing the various things against them they were already doing in terms of the... Well in terms of the financial matters. However, they could have consolidated their gains in French Indochina. They could have done some more operations in China to secure themselves more there. And they could have probably pushed further and built their infrastructure up more in the various islands, etc., that they already controlled before war broke out. I think if the Japanese had admitted that they had Yamatos in service, then I doubt the Americans would have wanted to do anything much till the Iowas came online. Maybe even other vessels. Because there is always the option of the Montanas. And the Americans might have gone, oh, We need to build the Montanas! In a Who knows what would have happened, but I think not omitting them, it's your great deterrent. It's the thing which will buy you the most time. Admitting they had them would probably have bought them time to not only complete them, even if they had said that they had them before they uh, admitted they were building them before they had them. 
but it possibly would have bought them time to build more aircraft carriers, to strengthen up their air forces, and all sorts of things, because it would have forced the Americans to adopt a defensive posture. Why would it force the Americans to adopt a defensive posture? Because suddenly all their battleships and their service ones would look weak and puny, because they have 18, they only have 16-inch guns, and this has 18-inch guns. Mm -hmm. Sending Yamato to the port visit to Pearl Harbor would be a power move. It would have been once it had completed. Terps God, it reminds me of the, of the Game of Thrones scene where Tyrion clarifies what a threat is to the head of the King's Guard. Yes. I am educating my nephew. And then he turns around to Bronn and goes, If Samarin uh, speaks again, kill him, I think it is, or something like that. And then turns around to Samarin, that is a threat. Well, it's the case. If I am telling, because of the power and the relative strike power and the fact that an attack sub is quite, a nuclear submarine is an invisible stealth unit. If I tell you I have that off your coast, that is a threat. Frig it off your coast, well, you know, theoretically you can see that that's on the surface. The fact that it can be armed to the teeth doesn't matter. A destroyer can turn up. And you can escalate these forces quite easily. Oh, we're sending a carrier. Oh, hello, um, X country. We're just giving you a heads up that we're sending a carrier group to exercise with our friends in Y country. Do you want to take part in the exercise as well? X country suddenly remembers. Hang on, you're allied with Y country. They're your friends. You're sending a carrier group. You're telling us that you're sending a carrier group. So if we go to war and carry on with our posturing against Y country, we could end up fighting with X with you and your carrier group. Oh, we'd rather not do that. It's gunboat diplomacy, but it's diplomacy, not threats. Diplomacy is far more subtle than threats. It is for, there is a threat there, but it's the unspoken diplomacy is the art of the unspoken threat, the implied and implicit. Hello, here is a carrot. Now this carrot you can take, but remember the implicit part of this carrot is that there's also a giant hammer which will whack down on your head if you do not take the carrot. Google Amit, Yamato is the poster boy for a guy thinking, oh, I forgot, I, I think I forgot something important, but what was it? Advertising. Rob Smith, parking a battleship in someone else's port is making a very big statement of interest in their actions. It is. Remember the Empire Cruise was basically the Royal Navy going around and parking hood in everyone's port for a few years, a few months. Now, careless. If you are going to move your fleet forward, and you are going to forward base them, and you are going to forward base your entire fleet, there are three things it behoves you to do. One of them is make sure that area is properly defended and secured. Secondly, make sure it's properly supplied so the fleet can exercise and posture properly. And Thirdly, and this is possibly the most important of all, make sure that the commander 
of the aforementioned fleet is getting the accurate, up-to-date intelligence they need to do their job. If you are not doing and delivering on all three of these things, you are being incredibly careless and you're going to lose your fleet. It happens. Nice to know, the Empire Cruise is basically what the IJN should have done with Yamato if World War II holds off longer. Yeah. Nines, I would also add, pay attention to other attacks on similar ports. Yes. That would be sensible. The Royal Rigger, wasn't the point of hiding the Sussex of Yamato just to prevent the Americans of building from, and British from building a counter? The trouble is, you cannot actually prevent the British build, and British Americans building a counter. They have more infrastructure than you. What you can do is you can launch it and show that the ships they are building are terrible. Remember, you win wars by not by forcing enemies to make decisions, but by making them forcing them into dilemmas. If you announce Yamoto to the world, the British then have a question. Do they complete Vanguard? Do they complete the last of the uh, King George V? Or do they start something new? Do they throw away what they've done and start something new because they are all outclassed by that? You force the same on the Americans. They are building battleships. They're building the Dakotas. They're building the Iowas. And that comes out. Suddenly what you're building doesn't look good enough. Not to the press. Not to your politicians. So what do you do? What do you do in that circumstance? Let's be honest, to, an, uh, to your average politician, that thing looks like the biggest, meanest, most powerful ship you could ever possibly build. Those guns are bigger than ours? It's festooned, it's covered with guns. Churchill would have had, a, had some form of, I don't know, gasm over that image and gone... <gasps> Roosevelt would have been... Absolutely annoyed if they'd come out and gone 18 inch guns. Because suddenly all the arguments the US Navy's been making about going 16 inch versus 18 inch guns sound moot because the Japanese have gone for 18 inch guns, so surely they've surely we've made the wrong decision. Or do we have enough 16 inch guns? Suddenly it's a case of hang on. Do we need to build instead of building the Iowas, we need to build the Dakotas? We need those 12 16-inch guns. Because 12 16-inch guns can match up to 9 9 18-inch guns. Oh, what, it's the Montanas, isn't it? It's the Montanas, yes. You'd probably have to build them the long tanners because, again, the Japanese would talk about the speed of this thing. And the Emotos are fast. So that becomes a problem. And suddenly you've got all these standards. Do you waste any money upgrading them? Or do you put all your money into building new ships? And should you really have any standards forward in the Pacific Fleet if they could run up against that thing? You would force... Basically announcing this forces your opponents into a dilemma. Yes, they can still outbuild you, but they can outbuild you whatever. This is how you buy yourself time. And this is how you lose time.
I was asking Pearl Harbor, if you attack a base, finish your job, launch the first strike. I would agree with that one. I see, honestly, I wonder what would happen if someone noted that Courageous said I will not be able to fire 15 inch guns and instead convince Fisher to complete them as a 9.2 inch armed cruisers. Oh, his, la his large light cruisers, which were basically him building fast battle cruisers to go in. It's more the 18 inch gun on Furious, which is absurd. The 15 inch guns sort of work. I don't think, well, Seneca, how would war change if you had a GPS guided 16 inch munitions? Um, you'd have first had to build a GPS system, and that's several decades of technological development away. But laser guided, well, you could have technically built radio, guide, uh, built radio guided, perhaps, 16 inch munitions, but. Uh, how do I put it? It's, it's having the actual control surfaces survive the firing of the 16 inch gun. In real life, the super heavy 16 shells the US had in an inventory would penetrate similar armor to the IGN 46 centimeter shells. Very true, it's found me. But real life doesn't matter versus image when you're dealing with politicians. And that's all about the image it would cast. If you're using it, deterrence is as much about image as it is reality. In fact, deterrence is almost more about image than reality. It's one of those things. If you have an Ali Burke currently turn up versus the latest Chinese destroyer, it looks... Uh, well, it looks like it does. We all know how powerful an Ali Burke is. We all know how powerful the Chinese destroyer is. But the Chinese destroyer looks like the more modern design. So if you have a Zumwalt turn up next to the Chinese destroyer, the Chinese destroyer looks... Uh, it doesn't look as good. But the Americans aren't, uh, have only built three of the Zumwalts. It's image. And that looks like the biggest, baddest, meanest thing in the world in 1939-1940 eyes. Nice different. So are there any post-World War II blunders coming up? What do you think, 96841? Doc, given the UK government pre-war viewed bombers as a cheap panacea if the Japanese announced Yamato, could we see it? No, and honestly, the, the government didn't. Oh, this is one of the things I have to remember. The government actually does studies of building bombers versus capital ships and their movement and study and their thing and their options. And the thing is, the bomber force is considered a good way of fighting a war in Europe to flee the, free the fleet up to go and fight the war in the Far East. The bomber force is a part of enabling the fleet actions because in the nicest way for bombers to be effective in the Far East, they need to be longer range than the British were building them. And the British know that. The British aren't stupid. The Air Ministry are not stupid. They are annoying, but they are not stupid. They're obsessed with Bomber Command. They're obsessed with the teachings of Gilead Duhay and Trenchard. They are not stupid, though. That's it. Hood's image worked back in the day because the design looked right. The guns, despite being one inch less, are lethal, and with a fast platform, that's basically faster than anyone had. Exactly. Dinner. It. 
If you have satellites and GPS navigation in World War II on amongst any of the Allied powers, then World War II changes dramatically. For starters, if you have satellite reconnaissance and well, then you're gonna have satellite-based communications. You're gonna have satellite-based reconnaissance. And, well, even if it's just a case of the sh the satellites passing over places, you know, and taking photos of ports. And telling you whether any ships are in those ports or not. That's going to be a huge advantage instead of you having to send planes. So what does Yamato get wrong? Oh, there are so many things wrong in its actual structure and design in the reality of the ship. It's got armor thick enough that we're not quite sure it had all solidified in the in the middle. But saying that, it's as also there's not enough of them. And the thing is, again, this is one of the reasons why I argue these ships are built for image versus reality. If I was building for reality and I was the Japanese, I'd want more hulls, hulls rather than less. Because having this thing with 9 to 18 inch guns, great. But why not build it Renown style with 6 18 inch guns? Build it slightly smaller. Build it slightly less so large, and build more of them. That'd be helpful. Ah, thank you, Bichon, uh, uh, Benjamin, Turon. Uh, you have just sent me the triple turreted Panzer Chief on, uh, on um, Twitter. It does look good. Pardon me, did I just burp a second ago? I don't know. This is the trouble. I haven't had anything but iron brew all day. Not since breakfast. Anyway. Managed to miss lunch. So, stupid. Ship design and force structure. We've had repeated problems. Not just in the UK, but in the world as a whole. Since World War, uh, since World War Two, with four structures and ship designs, it's gone increasingly theoretical. For example, if I'm building a two-carrier force, then I need to design my fleet around providing free escort groups. But really, I shouldn't be building a two-carrier force because two carriers aren't enough. I should have three. In which case, I need a four escort groups. Why? Because you always need a, how do I put this, a surety of escorts over what you have for your capital ships. You always need just that much more to guarantee the escort, to guarantee the structure. So let's put it this way. If I was sensible in building three carriers, so I could have one available, or four to guarantee one at sea, like I do with the strategic deterrent, I would then need four or five escort groups. And I need to think them through. What am I basing around? What kind of ships do I have? We're designing forces, we're designing structures around theoreticals that aren't always even all there. Sometimes we design our force structure reined around ships which are fitted with, fitted for, but not with. And they design, the force structure is designed around them being actually fitted with those capabilities in wartime. When they're not not fitted with a piece, and as we know with the counties, there's no guarantee they'll actually get them in wartime. And it's I know I've used the British there, but the other good example I use is the is the Type 22 frigates designed without a deck gun. Why? Because why would they need it? Well, actually, you very quickly work out you do need it even in the Cold War. It's a used as anti-aircraft defense and you could well you will probably run out of missiles whereas you will probably less likely to run out of shells or at least you won't run out of them as quickly because you can restock them far more easily 
yes, it's got a plentiful supply of missiles. But it's not a balanced ship in terms of its firepower and capabilities. And we see this repeatedly. We see repeatedly ships being designed to take the most cutting edge of technology rather than being designed and trying to, then trying to put it in, for example, the Zumwalt. And then when that technology is not ready, we scrap the whole program. When what really the reality is that's the perfect time to design something with the capability to be upgraded. So you fit it with this, but it has the capability to be fitted with that when that becomes available. And that's sensible. That's future-proofing. But that's not what we do. And I know we cover this a lot in bilge pumps, but it's, it is a, pro, uh, is a legacy of the Cold War because it starts creeping in during the Cold War where you have this scenario constantly being viewed through the eyes of, oh, it doesn't really matter because it'll all go nuclear within minutes anyway and then we won't, this won't matter. And that's not really true. That's not really sensible. Because you cannot design your fleet around the idea that what a one son of war scenario, i.e., we don't. Re there's not really much point in having a fleet or having this or that because it'll all go nuclear and then it'll be over. Well, then you might as well not have a fleet because you're not designing it sensibly. You have to design it around the scenarios you are likely to face. And if you're saying you're only going to face one scenario, then either that means everyone in the world has nuclear weapons and is a nuclear power, or you've got it wrong. And if you've got it wrong, then you're in trouble. Dunfrey, was it an error for the RN to not add a longer, lighter barrel to the gun to the 15-inch and get something like 15.50 for renowned Warfight Adult? Yeah, it was. It would have been sensible. It's the big reason why I think the King George V should have been built with nine 15 15-inch guns, but we'll leave that to one side. Scott. Also, the heavy bomber was kind of looked at like we would look at New Zealand. The heavy bomber guaranteed mutually assured destruction as it would always get through. I know, that's some of the theory, but then the uh, RAF starts developing its own fighter command and realises very quickly that they kind of mucked up. They did aim to build four of the Amatos as well. Nice thing, the IGA were never going to get five young motors, were they? Never before a war began, no. And it's doubtful they ever have the resources to build all five. They would have gutted their shipbuilding program for, dec for decades to do build five. Lions, I still, I still have to say it's a form of blunder. It is a form of blunder, but it's not really an epic blunder to, mis uh, to misidentify destroyers and frigates as cruisers when you're engaging them at range and they're acting the way they are. It's not a big thing. You know, in a nice way, if you're doing it with tribal class destroyers, you can be excused for doing it because they have a very similar outline in terms of shape and a very similar line in, in, time, in terms of their portholes, etc., two cruisers. As for sure, is not scrapping technology that isn't ready yet why the British UK built then ran away from the armoured cruiser? Mm, 
not really. And then we have the Falklands War. And that it happens is careless because it's careless messaging. It's careless force structure. It's careless pretty much everything. The Falklands War should never have happened. There should have been no scenario that a power like Argentina would look at its neighbours and go, which one's the easiest for me to fight, Chile or Britain, and decide Britain, which was supposedly prided itself on being such a power in the world, and still does to this day, was the weaker and easier option. And it's both these things feed into the Falklands War. Some oh, interesting discussions going on. One of the things you sort of do realise in the Falklands War that you have going on is this whole we know, we've learnt from the lessons of the past and we've moved on to it and we're fighting this kind of war. The Royal Navy in both cases is structured as a North Atlantic anti-submarine force slash amphibious warfare force. Thankfully for the amphibious warfare force because without it you wouldn't be able to do the Falklands. But they're not really structured for inshore work. Hence, they don't have the 40mm guns they need on them. They don't have the firepower they need on in terms of fire support for gra uh, for ship for surface uh, ground forces ashore. Hence, no 4.5 inch gun fitted on the that. I would say the Invincibles, as lovely as they are as through deck cruisers, etc., do need to be a little bit bigger to actually be a viable unit. And yes, they are built as baby carriers, but there's building a baby carrier and there's building a baby carrier. An extra five or 6,000 tons would have made the Invincibles a far more difficult prospect for anyone to attack. It's just the whole scenario is not good. But the British are not the only navy which are in this scenario. There is not a single NATO navy which would really have been good at fighting the Falklands War. Not a single one. They all learnt stuff from it, and most of them learnt that, oh sugar, we need more of X, Y, and Z. Sean Brennan, problem versus dilemma. Uh, we the problem is an issue that has a solution. With more money, build a better ship. Dilemma is an issue, no good solution. We don't have enough money for a good fleet, so neither uh, need fleet or uh, so no fleet or misspun uh, fleet. Well, this is the point I made that the Yamatos earlier would have presented a dilemma to the Americans because it would have been and the British. It would have been a case of, do we complete the ships we are building? Do we upgrade the ships we are building and then uh, before we complete them, so we revise the designs on the, st uh, on the stocks, or do we scrap the ships we're building and build something new to de deal with this? That's the, the scenario you put it through. And you don't have the shipyards or the capacity to do all three. Not even the Americans have the shipyard and the capacity to do all three. They can do options A, B, or C. Battleships are incredibly costly and expensive in terms of what you're doing. And especially 
pre nineteen uh, pre Midway Coral Sea, pre World War Two breaking out of the Pacific, the capital ship was still seen as the queen of the world. This is all then f then feeds into the Cold War scenario. And as people have been talking about, you know, if you don't have enough money, you just focus in on one thing. Well, that's the trouble then. The blunder and the stupidity is that you're not investing enough money. And that's a government mistake. Because you're trying to get the security and insurance on the cheap. And as we all know, the, the whole thing with insurance is if you pay for cheap insurance, don't expect to get, no, get much money back whenever there's a problem. Because they will do everything they can not to pay out. Because that's the whole point of cheap insurance. It's so you can say you have insurance, it's not so it actually does anything for you. It's a false economy. If you pay for decent insurance, thankfully I do, considering my car got written off recently. Before anyone asks, yes, that uh, I did predict when I spent all the money on the computer and all the money I, I had, etc., on the computer, that something would go wrong. The going wrong was driving the car to the National Archives and having an accident in nose to tail traffic at less than five miles an hour and the car getting written off. Fun, because of its age. So now I've got to find a new car. Hmm. But don't worry, I pay for decent insurance so I've got the money coming from the insurers that will allow me to buy a decent car. I'm probably going to go back to Volvo this time. I've been, I've had two Subarus. I feel like having another Volvo. But leaving that to one side, I pay for decent insurance, so touch wood, I'm looked after. One of my friends has a habit of always buying the cheapest insurance they can get. So far, every time, and they've written off more cars than I have by a long way, every time... They end up with a fight on their hands and barely getting any money back from the insurers. My insurance costs, I would say, 50% more than theirs does, probably. I'd rather pay for my insurance than theirs. Now, this is the point when you're building your defences and your force structures. If you're trying to do these things on the cheap, then you cannot be surprised when it doesn't work. And everyone has tried on various ways to do it on the cheap. There is always corruption in procurement. In the, sense, it, the corruption can be different. It, the corruption can be at the level of, in some countries it seems, the generals taking 90% of the money and using 10% to deliver it on a, basically a shoestring and using 90% of the money to give themselves more riches. Or it can be in the various accounts of the private companies doing the development and research, the R&D. Because again, how much price can you play, what value can you put on an idea, on a technology, on something developed from scratch? Especially if it's a bespoke, unique system, which only one power needs and it costs a lot to develop. It's going to be costing a lot to get because someone has to make a profit because they are t private companies and private companies exist to make a profit it's not a dirty thing it's their motivation for a being it happens I think SA Defence put up an opinion piece two weeks ago and I'm trying to explain to someone that the UK isn't changing their policy and the person thinks we view Argentina as a dictatorship. Yeah, we don't view them as a dictatorship. We just aren't doing anything about them. We upgrade the defences in Falklands periodically ever since, well, ever since the Falklands War.
That's right. He seems to have the idea the USA can't sanction other democratic countries, even though they can. Oh, the USA sanctioned other democratic countries. They don't normally do it. They usually do it... How do I put it? In terms of sanctioning by democratic countries against each other, they tend to do it passive-aggressively rather than actively. It tends to come in form as, Oh, are the customs works taking a very long time to clear? Oh, we're so sorry. Are our customs officers that we see we're so undermanned, we've got not enough people, it's it's there's just a terrible backlog. I do apologize. Now, sorry, the thing the UK politicians were shell shocked World War Two and wanted to retreat from the world after the end of the British Empire. Mm, yes and no. Depends on which one you're talking about. Uh, not British. It sounds like my health and dental insurance high deductible, so they pay for nothing despite 110 dollars a week. Come on, speak on the shlockers. Please check your Discord PM, please. I will do. <sighs> Tanya uh, Verka, Doxy, I think it was Sir Friendly Hadley, pa uh, Friendly Hadley Page that said, you can't win wars on the cheap. Mm, probably. Santa Canary, by the way, with this uh, PC, you can probably live stream Ultimate Average Journals. Probably. Probably. I'm not sure. Uh, the graphics card might... I'm not sure whether the graphics card would hold up to that. It's only 12 gigabytes. And you see, you know, it's a 3060. It's lovely, but it is only a 3060. Um, let's see, yes. I haven't kept the full box for the graphics card, but I have kept this part of it, because it's just cool. <laughs> and before anyone asks why I haven't kept the box for the graphics card, is because I don't keep the boxes. As a rule, they sit in there, and if I am going to move it, the graphics card, etc., gets taken out of the computer, because... Do, and please note this, everyone, and take this as a piece of advice. If you are going to be driving around with a tower unit and you're moving it any considerable distance, I'm not talking just walking it between a rooms or something like that, I'm talking it going in a car or a van, take out the graphics card and wrap it up safely in something which preferably doesn't allow, doesn't give it static. So wrap it, wrap it up safely. Do not leave it in there, because it's a big piece of weight which is only held in place by a couple of screws and one bit of plastic. You don't want that moving around inside a car. Many two nights ago, on my way home from getting, oh, well, having a nice evening out, uh, a massage. Nice. A dude decided to use my bumper to stop instead of his brakes. Oops, my foot slipped off. I had fun in that my brakes didn't work. I was pressing them and it didn't stop. And this was at five miles an hour. Which was sort of a case of slow speed. And it was a case of, do I grab the handbrake or not? There are people walking along next to me. The car's behaving strange. I'm not sure. And then I actually then tapped the person in front and that slowed me. That stopped, and I stopped. But it was a case of... And, yeah, that caused interesting. and we It got looked into, and I think... I haven't read the full report yet, but from what I've been told on the phone, as I understand it, it was mechanical issues in the car, which I'm not sure how they came, because I'd literally driven it all over Cornwall and various other things a few days beforehand and been fine. So it had come back, sat on the drive for a couple of days, and then I'd taken it out, and the brakes had been dodgy. Always fun when that happens. Depends what age of Volvo you get, Colin. Um, the modern ones do have crumple zones. I know, I've had a Volvo written off before because of its crumple zone. In a similar scenario where everyone was cramming on their brakes because little... Um, uh, some people were running across the road, let's put it this way. 
could buy a T62, but I don't think the Russians are selling them off cheap anymore. Oh, Malaga, yeah, my insurance are... They're supposed to be paying me this week. Lions, I think the biggest problem in late 20th century and now 21st is not letting engineers do their job without trying to cut all the possible corners they can make and to make things as cheap as possible. Yeah, that happens. It does happen. Fair enough. Last time I checked, you can get an APC for second-hand Mondeo money. Not, no need to worry about the bumps in traffic there. No. But I'm not sure if they'd let me. I, I, I would really like a nice sort of sort of armoured car. I would be quite happy with a six-wheeled um, Saladin or something like that to wander around in. But I'm, I, I've been told by Drac that if I get a Saladin, he will personally hide off from the roads. Because he's worried I'd actually use it to get through traffic. Does got a thirty sixty should be fine for a ten eighty p stream. Clock speed is more important than memory for streaming. Yeah, this clock speed I can clock it up to four point seven. It stand it usually operates at four point two, but if I go into the BIOS and set it to the advanced, it can go up to four point seven gigahertz processor. My coach. Now you have the new PC cane, do you think you'll restart the sci-fi game that you were going to use to demonstrate text choices? Yes, probably will do. Did your, um, did your car have an ABS fault? Um, I don't... I... It was, I think, to do. It was the. I think there was air in the brake li brake lines or something like that. There were. There was a whole lot of discussion on the phone at one point. You never know. The S. Darius was the Ukraine's may end up selling some T-62s after the debacle. There are lots of things which could potentially solve. Uh, th this is the other problem with sort of dealing with Ukraine, and that there are all sorts of interesting issues which can be dealt with. Melly six hundred. That's very sensible. Zero interest in waiting hours for police. Call the dude insurance. Filed claim. Put him on the phone so he could give a statement admitting fault. Also, video of him apologising for it. Very good. Um, I have to admit with myself. I've phoned my insurer straight away. Gave the number of the person I'd hit. Told them the exact thing, and it was all sorted. And they and then I checked in with the person afterwards, and the insurers had already called them before I called uh, before I called to check the insurers had called them, which was good. So. I was quite happy with that. They were good. They're a good insurance company. Nice second. So I had come up with the idea of May twenty fifth and nineteen eighty two with CVA one in the Falklands might have gone, but the DRM, bought me a box used bombs or missiles to to attack twenty fifth of May. I'm not going to answer that question at night security for one because you already asked me to me on the Brooklyn, um, video. And I have already answered it, therefore, in the comment response video, which comes out tomorrow. So yes, this is the this is some of the trouble when you ask me repeat the question repeatedly at the same time, because I've already answered it. It's just coming out tomorrow in the comment response, and I'm going to let you wait for that to watch it, because I recorded quite an interesting answer and a full explanation. 
because I might have phoned up someone who would know whether how you would attack a carrier with a buccaneers and asked him how he would do it. Ooh. There are some You may try looking at Polish Surprise. They are 8x8 armored cars. Ooh, that could be fun. I wouldn't mind an 8x8. I have a feeling that when I pulled into the Shell Garage, they might be slightly upset with me in the amount of fuel I would take. But I'd enjoy it. I wonder if I could get it re registered as a farming vehicle so I could have red diesel. I'm sure I could do a little bit of farming with it. We'll see. Hi there, Richards. Memories. Brake lines do rust through. I had it with Hubmons. Oosh. Oh, Dan Freeman, you have sent some very nice pictures. Oh. I could just imagine what you could convert that into. That could be, oh, the sort of, the sort of ambulance looking one you could convert into a very nice mobile home. Pinska, 718. It's definitely for an Overland Expedition vehicle. I, I, I could use the ambulance. Oh, I, I could definitely do something with that. Sorry. Completely distracted. Thank you, Dan, for completely distracting me. Uh, a 6x6 six six vehicle. Yes, I could turn that into a lovely... Sorry, I, 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 do a, I am one of those people who does watch the various exploring channels and think about converting a vehicle, sort of some sort of nice armoured truck and driving round all the history sites in Europe and Africa and everywhere else I could go. And that is sort of, if I don't have, if I am not lucky enough to ever have a sort of a wife and a family and those sort of things, that is what I will probably spend my retirement years doing. I will probably sell everything up, buy a aforementioned vehicle and drive around the world doing that. That would be my that would be my way my version of retirement. Have couple of dogs, have vehicle, will travel. Daniel Pollux, no, that won't qualify you for red diesel. That's annoying. Dang. Mm-hmm. <sighs> you never know. Uh, many circuiting rogues. Uh, that's the thing with brake line rusting through. That will compromise the single circuit. Modern vehicles have at least two circuits. ABS unit is only is one uh, is one single point of fail. Mm -hmm. That's good. Register it as an experimental agricultural show vehicle. That way it's exempt from most of the MOT and tax as well. That sounds interesting. <laughs> oh. No, no, no. I, 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 I'm just thinking about the commute to Kingston University if I was to in doing the commute in a Spartan tank now. Okay, a Spartan APC. I, I think it'll be fun. Anyway, will we ever learn? This is the summary. No. Because the whole point about epic blunders is that, honestly, they happen because we are stupid or careless, and humans are inherently stupid and careless. Humans are. We can be amazing. We can be wonderful things. But we also have a tendency to be stupid and careless every now and again. Because we get lulled into a full sense of confidence. And that's usually when you become stupid and careless. You usually make stupid decisions when you have so much power you think, Well, I have 200 ships. They have 100. Why do I? There's no chance I can lose this. Charge in. Who cares? About order or thinking about whether or not these ships are trained up to the same level they are or whatever. And there's plenty of stupidity around. Being careless, 
usually happens when you go, well, of course I have technological superiority, of course, because ultimately epic blunders tend to happen because of ego. And that's the reality of them. No, sorry, everyone. It's hard to keep track of what questions I've asked you, Doc. Don't worry, I keep track of them, Knight 6831. I do keep track of them. That's right. There are also military command and radio trucks, 4x4s. Four four. So there's also a show about service on one Brit turned into an expedition camper. I know. You can make some really good expedition campers using ex-military vehicles. You can have real fun in them. Dan F. Berker, uh, see, if you could have uh, an amphibious APC, you could arrive at Kings and Vida Thames. Not really, because if I'd reached the Thames, I've gone too far when I'm driving to my uni. I am, um, yeah, it's basically, if I actually hit the Thames, I've gone past the uni. Um, that, oh, there is a Saracen for sale. Price six grand. I don't think I'm getting that much for my car, but I could do. I I, I could probably get some, some finance, uh, some extra funds from elsewhere if I put it. If I thought about it, there are options, and I'm sure there are some uncles who would quite happily give me the difference in money, in order to um, live out their own dreams. We'd have to do some work on that. Is it even the same vehicle? It looks like two different vehicles, but they have some. For, they have two of them for sale. Oh, that could be fun. Nice to everyone. I honestly had to start using an Excel spreadsheet for your questions. I'm quite honest on that. I did have to start using a spreadsheet. You do do a lot of questions, and I like them all, but I have to do a spreadsheet of them to keep track of them all and check if I've answered them already. <laughs> oh, it's one of those things. I can do it at the moment. I'm the, the channel is just about the size where it's still viable to do that. It grows anymore, and I'm probably hiring someone to help me with that, or bribing someone with chocolate if they're if they're a particular cousin who has offered the help. But I would need to bribe them with chocolate. That's <laughs> If the Freedom Independence Class had been built as frigates, so as yes, would they be better talked about? Um, if they'd been built as frigates, they'd have probably made more sense. But you'd have built a different ship. Because the moment you call them frigates, you'd have and if you wanted the same speed, you'd have made them bigger. And that would have made them... They'd have had to do some changes to them. They'd have had to... Probably had to get rid of quite so much aluminium hull. They'd have probably had to work out whether or not the speed was really as essential as they dreamed it was, put in more firepower, all sorts of things would have to be done. Danny Potts, I'm just trying to work out if I could land a Harry in the t National Archives car park. You could, but don't expect to take off because you would melt the tarmac on your way down. Oh. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. 
I hope you've enjoyed. I'm going to answer the last few questions now, but it is now quarter past ten UK time, and I'm probably going to start getting complaints from the family that I am out living with my computer too long again, and I haven't yet had dinner. So I'll answer the last questions, and then I will go. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. What have we got coming up? Uh, we have got, next week, we have got the Daedalus class. Project Pre BC304 of Earth. Thank you very much for the Saracen Fund, Michael Cooch. I doubt I will be getting a Saracen anytime that soon, but um, I can dream. I have to say, I am definitely looking at the um, 6 by 6 uh, the, the six by six, um, APC things, the uh, Pinciaga, because uh, an expeditionary camping vehicle sounds like a cool thing to me and would be a nice one to have. As said, me, two dogs and um, the open road are definitely on the plans for retirement at the moment and there are various options in about oh, 45, 50 years time. No, the section of audio. Alex, just tell them you're working with the computer to fund dinner. Mm-hmm. It's always, it's always the case. I have to say, it's one of the things that I have been finding interesting lately. I enjoy this a lot. But um, I am considering producing a video of random things said to me in job interviews about the fact that I have a YouTube channel. I think it would cause a lot of fun. I said, did the RN dodge a bullet by not going an LCS route? As I considered that a British declined or not declined world, they would never build LCS ships. Uh, the British were not really keen on the LCS route. If you consider the British, as a rule, have always they had battle cruisers which were built for speed, but that's the only real class which they ever built where they've been obsessed with being the fastest. And battle cruisers were the fastest, the biggest, and the best. And that was basically a capital ship form of doctrine. Take care, Leslie Mitchell. Thank you, John Sykes. Thank you, Carmen Gasberg. Thank you, Joss Funk. Thank you, Dan Freeman. Darius Rautsky, Gogo Lander, Colin Cameron, Melanie1640. Thank you, Tanya Velika. Thank you, Dan and Jack and Glyn and Sean. And, of course, thank you, Stafford. Hope your mom's having a nice, a nice birthday for adminning. Thank you, Knight6831, for all the questions. Thank you, Richards. Thank you, IO2. Right, too. What mistake by one party do you consider to be the biggest missed opportunity for another party? The British lack of a night fighting, coherent night fighting drill in World War One and co a comprehensive night fighting drill in World War One could have given the Germans a massive opportunity for actually winning a Jutland and actually sinking enough of the British fleet they could have knocked Britain out of the war. And that's a reality which they didn't do. And they had the opportunity because they were fleeing at night and they were leaving in the night. If you consider how well they do in the night action, because the British are having to be so cautious because they know they have more ships out there than the Germans do. Whereas the Germans know the odds are they're dealing with British ships. They could have been a real there could have been a really interesting result if they'd be more aggressive with it. Oh, not building uh, on not building ships on the cheap, making something impressing to impress scare politicians. How much better an improved investment would for GW96 compared to the Candy Class destroyers? It would have been interesting, let's say. I prefer to build eight or twelve GW96s, though. Night Division. Thank you, Nautical Wolf. Thank you, Dirt Squad. 
no, sorry, so the missiles during the battleship, battle cruisers turn them off LCS ships. Not really. It's a case of the British had stopped building for speed before then. The British started building for balance a while back, and they've kept it up with it. Take care, night time productions. Take care, Dirt Squad. Thank you, Gogo Lander. Ooh. Dot, battle cruiser or fast battleship, what's best? What do I want to do with it? Am I fighting battles against other battleships? In which case, I probably want a fast battleship. Am I doing commerce annihilation? And commerce, uh, basically, commerce interdiction, i.e., raiding and anti surface raider, which is not a battleship. Yeah, then I want a battle cruiser. Fast carrier escort depends on how fast I want my carrier group to move. <laughs> Take care, Rosmith. Come on, guys, a few words on the spearhead class expeditionary expeditionary uh, transports. That's uh, everyone and Melanie sixteen forty. You want me to make the video about what I've been told in interviews about you making a YouTube channel? Ooh, I might do that. Night from Productions, last one. How would you have built the Fearless and Intrepid if you were in charge of that program in the 1960s? Um, well, for starters, in the 60s, I would have built them with hangar space for a hangar because I would have looked at Albion and Bulwark and gone, we always were going to need helicopters. I'd have built them with more command space because there's always a name, there's always a need for command redundancy, even though they are supposed to be just transport vessels. I would build them with command redundancy in mind, and I would have given them probably some four and a half inch guns and some forty millimeter guns if I could have done. So give them the forty millimeters for inshore work. And the four and a half inch guns to provide troops with fire support. And they would have had double doubles on the four and a half inch guns. Oh, and I'd have built at least three of them. That's good. If the British had neutralized the high sea fleet at Jutland, what would the Entente have been able to do with supremacy in the North Sea? They'd have pushed through the Denmark Straits, into the Baltic, and threatened the Ger and blocked off Germans, and German forces from being able to operate in the Baltic, blocked off their imports through Sweden, etc. In that scenario, so they wouldn't have been getting iron ore and food supplies from the North Sea, and generally would have harassed Germany and probably done an amphibi uh, prepared to do an amphibious operation on their Baltic coast. Sean Brennan, funny interview reviews are person to person, not YouTube video to piss off possible future employers who may think they were mentioned. That's probably my instinct of why not to do it. But some of them would seriously make quite a lot of people laugh. Just one night, Mark Harkness. And subscribes, thank you, Mark. I can't, uh, I can't wait until the person interviewing you is a subscriber. Yeah, perhaps I'll do something on Discord and do a chat. I keep meaning to do a Discord live, you know, do the scenarios that I know Drac and others do, and I know we should do as part of our server, but every time I look at organising one, I've also got balancing teaching and this and that, and I do like to take some time to spend with my family. Don Giovanni, what are you planning to have for dinner? At this time of night, the only good place open is a Chinese takeaway. I don't feel like cooking this late. Well, take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Oh, that's quicker. 
That's disturbingly quick compared to how it used to be. Take care, everyone. Thank you for watching, and hope you enjoyed. Bye. And as ever, thank you for all the support, the subscribers. Thank you for the people who share the channel on their social media. Thank you to the people who like the videos. Thank you to the people who are patrons. Thank you to the people who do the super chats and the super thanks. Thank you for all that. You do fund my research. This is my research funding now. That's actually one of the interesting conversations I have had in interviews where people have gone, so how are you funding your research? Well, I do this channel on YouTube and I do this, uh, these other things and that's how I fund my research programs. And they sort of, they, they almost, they find it quite strange that that's how I do it and that's how it actually works. And that provides enough security for me to fund the research and enough um, support and help. And frankly, it's, it's basically, as I try and explain them, it's kind of crowdfunding my research. And I've been surprised by how kind and how supportive you all are. They are very surprised by how kind and supportive you all are, so thank you for it, because you really do make it all possible. And you make the books I'm currently working on, and I've told on, discussed on Patreon exactly what the projects I'm currently working on are, and all these things possible. Thank you very much. Take care. And thank you. <laughs>